Welcome to Have Movies Will Game, the only podcast on the globe where we take you, our friendly listener, through the best and worst movies of yesterday and today, and then discuss ways that you can play them at your gaming table. But the fun doesn't stop there, no sorry. Every few episodes, our intrepid hosts, Matthew, Dusty, and Nathaniel, will ask you, the listener, to vote on which movie they will play as an RPG, recorded in video and in glorious black and white, and brought to you through the electronic wonder of the internet. Now, let's start the show! Alright, I have to have this back. <laughs> fun, so, fun story. Uh, fun story about this preparation, H. Mm-hmm. Is I bought it? it for fucking hemorrhoids. Uh-huh. But then I put it in my... Coffee? Top drawer in my cabinet in the bathroom. I also keep my toothpaste in that. Oh, so I have no, these two no, 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 no. that. So one day uh, I was in the dark. Why do you have small toothpaste? Like travel toothpaste. Whatever. And one day I was reaching in, and uh, actually my toothpaste tube, I think, is significantly larger than this. Okay. But whatever. It's a tube. It's got a cap. I reached in. It was dark. I pulled it on. I had to brush my teeth. And then I put it in my mouth, and suddenly, this is wrong. Literally all hell broke loose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that didn't last too long. But uh, now I keep them separately. <laughs> that's, that's a good thing. That's usually a good idea, I think. Are you doing this? Let's do this. <laughs> Are we going to do this? I Let's think this. so. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Matthew. And I am Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel. And today we're doing 13 Assassins. This was uh, Nathaniel's pick, part of our uh, re- revenge run here. Mm-hmm. Uh, last week was... What was last week? It was... Uh, Who even knows anymore? Oh, it was V for Vendetta. Yes, V for Vendetta. Uh, Nathaniel's favorite. Yes. Uh, <laughs> now, I almost had a similar reaction with this one because the beginning of this movie was so incredibly brutal where they're establishing a villain. Now, you can establish a villain in many ways. They chose to go with probably the most horrific establishment of a villain I've ever seen. I, I like the establishment of the villain a lot. It was... Okay, you're a psychopath. Too. No, no, just no, 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 no. Not, okay, not not in in not in showcasing nubs, but um, but just the the coldness of that character mm-hmm. uh, was very Gary Oldman esque, in my opinion, because Gary Oldman can do an extremely cold killer, evil antagonist, and he kind of played that. This the 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 guy that played the bad guy, same thing. I think he I think he could do. I think that guy wants to be Gary Oldman when he grows up. He was, I think they did a good job of the story of portraying him as a villain. I thought he was a little effete. He was just like, whatever. Oh, very much so. Yeah. The payoff with him at the end is fantastic. That was good. Um, there, there are things I really liked about this movie, and there's a, there are things that I just... I, so I, you, you said something interesting when we were discussing this movie. You gave it a, a samurai sword rating out of 10. Yes. So yours was? I think six. Six out of yeah, 10, six samurai, out of 10 swords. samurai swords. And I want to I want to start putting in like a rating system. Like 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 John Wick's like how many like cuz we're going to do John Wick. Uh so like how many if you like it like how many assassins would you give it out of 10? Should well, it, okay, hold on. Hold on. Mm-hmm. Now, let's quantify this rating system here. Are it's we just going arbitrary. on an American school rating it's just, system? It's just completely we fucking arbitrary. Where five is average? Because I'd say five out of, of ten you might consider average, but if it was an American school rating ten, five out of ten is a fucking failure. So Five is average. Okay. I, I would, yeah, I would say average. Now, do we want to keep it steady, or do we want it to be each movie related? Oh, initially it was, just, I, like this one was initially, it was like, oh, I give it two out of six samurai swords. I was like, oh, I'll put it to ten. So we don't use a base 12 system, you know, damn it. I, <laughs> actually, I, I've been thinking about this for a long time. I have a counter proposal. Hear me out. Mm-hmm. This is something that I, uh, a long time ago, I fancied myself writing movie reviews on a blog, and then I decided uh, I ain't got time for that. But I got time for this. And one of the ideas that I had for the review system was a very simple, instead of a numerical system, the review was either buy it, rent it, borrow mm-hmm. it, or avoid it. No, because I, th- I think that's completely relative because there are movies like this. You, you would say go and watch this anytime it's in the theater or go and buy it. Buy it. Where I'd just be like. Also, you eh. forgot streaming. Well, rent it. I'd be like, eh, if you're bored, sure. Borrow it. Uh, eh. Or avoid it. I, I just like, like, a, I, I like a numerical system. 
I have words with you on this and V so for Vendetta the, the when numerical we get into system this. Is tough, though. So <laughs> I follow a lot of video game blogs mm. and I follow a lot of video game discussion groups. And one of the things that pe- we talk about a lot is how the video game rating system is bullshit. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know. Halo is always at the top, so I'm good with it. Well, I, I get that you have your favorites, but if you games it's journalism, more of a fetish. Games <laughs> journalism rating the rating system numerically makes no sense because some websites they give something you know 99 out of 100 9.5 out of 15 and it's that whole discussion out of between, 10. are we going on a zero to 10 with five being the middle scale or are we going on a 100 percent with 70 percent being a c rating kind of thing so it's either the problem I think with that, rating that's systems, a false equivalency i don't think that no those they, they two... are completely different but Rating aggregate sites merge them together. So one website might give something a 5 out of 10 saying it was average, it was okay, whereas another website might give something a 50% out of 100 with 50% being garbage. Yeah, making that an F, so to speak. Exactly. Right. So I was just trying to be funny because like initially system. it was going to be like but I liked out of six. I, I liked, I liked like two the out of six samurai swords. samurai swords. So I guess what we have to figure out is what is our base and what does it mean? I think the base Whatever for this should be 13 goes. samurai swords. So out of 13, how there's no base it? 13. But this is yeah, the 13 10. assassins. Eh. So we should modify it for everything instead of sticking with the 10. I, I, I don't know about modifying it for everything. I think it'd be like if it were, if it's, if it's Star Wars, like out of 10 lightsabers or, or 10 blasters. Why 10? Because we're on a base 10 system. Why 10? Why? Because we have 10 fucking fingers. One at eight. Because we don't have eight fingers. It's like I said, initially number. I was going to joke around I'm like it's out of six. Base 12 is better than six. base eight. I think base 8 is better than base 10. I, don't, I haven't really thought about base 12. I'm base eager 12, to hear your thoughts on this. Base 12 works very well in geometry and physics and calculus. So does base 8. Base 12 works better. Base 8 is just 2 to the 3rd. Yeah. I'm a bartender, but I know this. Okay. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I would say we're doing this in America. Mm-hmm. Um, so we follow the imperial system, so that's 12 inches, motherfucker. I'll go with base 12. Okay. But base eight is madness. Madness. And I was just <laughs> ten and works for me. I mean, that's I like much ten too. All the standard. I I think what should change should be the uh, should be what like we're 10. doing. Yeah, like out of ten, you're just a contrarian. Or out, really or out, or out, out of twelve, <laughs> or out of ten assassins, or out of. I think we should give it a new number every time. For, you know, like for this, it should be out of thirteen. Well, what would you do for something that doesn't have a number in it? You come up with something off your butt. Or let's just not even do it because yeah, he's going no. so far deep into the weeds, <laughs> and I hate that term. I, well, however, <laughs> I must give you kudos for using that term properly. Okay, nobody ever uses that term. Yeah, properly. I know, and that's yeah. why I hate it in my so in, many in of my, my uh, work environment. Yeah, they they use the word into the weeds to mean let's get hands on with mm-hmm. that, but that's not what it fucking means. My, my no, f- it means you're fucked and it's going down. My yeah. uh, my former employee uh, there towards the end, one of the things that was said on almost every conference call, uh, I would present information to be disseminated out to the other ranks, and. Uh, one of the one of the women on the on the other teams would say, "Can we just socialize this? We should just socialize this out." Let's to drill everybody. down into that. I'm like, "What do you mean by socialize? You mean disseminate, right?" She's like, "No, let's socialize this to the rest of the groups." What does that mean? You're not. It's using... not good for your urethra if you're you not... disseminate. You really have to let that go. Yeah. Like you're not. You're not using. I... If you choke it off, it's really bad for the entire path. Anyways, I gave it six out of ten samurai swords. Ten. I'm, ten I'm, samurai I'm swords. I'm going to go higher than that. I, 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 I thought... I revolt. I, I thought at, for the first 20 minutes, I was like, what the fuck is wrong with you people? I saw Why are chat. we watching yeah, I this? know. <laughs> However, once the, the movie proper started, I actually really enjoyed this movie. A lot more than I thought I was due to those... First twenty minutes, I was ready to walk away from this. If one more from, horrific thing from, happened, from Nubby and uh, from Nubby, the, the wife, <laughs> rape, husband, kill to the family for target practice, I was like, I can't watch this. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they were simply establishing the villain, and yeah, they you did that complain and... about the villains not being black and white. This was very much a black or white villain. Yeah, I complained about the villains not being black and white. What? This was very much. A I, I think he was just complaining about I don't the villain complain being about that black much and white. Fucking, I, I, I like try and humanize atrocity. the villain at every turn. What? Can you humanize this name? man? No. Good. I didn't like him. <laughs> so what? <God. laughs> this is one of those times where I won't uh, certainly won't be taking the villain's side. Um, is that a first? 
Probably. Well, uh, I don't last, think, probably. I don't, I don't think you were friends with Shredder. He was kind of a douche, too, right? I like Shredder. Shredder? I like Shredder. I like many aspects you of like Shredder. You like Tatsu. I like Tatsu a lot. But I don't tatsu think you like cool. Shredder. No, I didn't I like have strong Zorg. feelings about that particular Shredder. Zorg. Well, Zorg is a good villain. Yeah. Zorg is a great Again, villain. Again, Gary Oldman. Yeah. Zorg. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. This villain was not Zorg. <laughs> he was not. No. Uh, th- this was an archetype villain. I mean, the, the pampered dandy who is out of touch with common humanity. It was... He was evil. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he talked about yeah. bringing you know, back the age of war because he had a heart on at the end from watching everybody fight. Yeah. Th- this was really rough. And like I said, I almost walked away from it and would have just fudged it and made up something after reading about it. But, <laughs> oh, my God, it got so much better. So it really is worth your time to sit through that, that horrific fucking opening <laughs> bit. But, um, yeah, that was that was rough for me. I, I had a hell of a time. I, I have some triggers. There are some deep down caveman shit in me, and the abuse of women and children to that degree really fucking made me yeah, go. As, oh, as must kill something now. As Can't a, watch, as must a fight. writer, <laughs> yeah. there are like there are two hard stops for me as a writer. We've talked about this in a previous episode. Yeah, yeah. and I think we've talked about it in person too. But for those that have no idea, they're just now maybe listening. Um, yeah, my two hard stops are you you don't hurt children and no rape. That's the, the things that I don't want to put in any of my stories. Well, he was a bad guy. Yeah. He yeah. Awful things. And uh, I'm not going to justify anything that he did. He so if, if, he if did just, awful things. just just for this once, I, I will convert by rounding because they don't work. Out of 13 yes. samurai swords, how many would you give it? Fucking 13. Of this course is, you This would. is one of now, my top 10 you, you favorite picked this movie. Ever. Why Why? Why does this movie call to you? Well, I have reasons, and I'll discuss those in the second half more intently. But this movie, to me, uh, when I was studying for a former project, this movie spoke to me the most. I feel that Takeshi Mika really did a good job of personifying that samurai ideal. Like, he took... The, the legendary samurai belief system. He took the concepts of Bushido, turned them a little bit upside down, messed with them, and made this movie showcasing the true horror of that belief system. End of the time. End of the time. Yeah. But specifically, like, the horror of Bushido. Like, the horrible aspects of that code of honor and that belief system which drove an entire culture. Yeah. Or at least a subset of an entire culture. <sighs> I thought that the emotional portrayals from the actors were amazing. I thought that, like, there's a moment early in the movie, very early, right when, oh, God, the and what's his name? The agent of the Shogun. I forget his name. Anyway, he is... He's talking to Shinzaman. His his right hand man? The Shogun the guy who, who gave Shinzaman the job. Oh yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. The one that they're always it's, talking uh, about. That's, is... Uh Sir Doi. Sir Yeah, Sir Doi. Doi. Okay, so real quick, I'm gonna interrupt you real quick. Okay. I, I'm sorry, I have to I have to say this before we go too far into this. You guys know that I do not pronounce names very well. Oh, I was expecting a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> especially with foreign movies, uh these names that we're gonna come across. I am apologizing profusely right now. I'm probably going to have to sound them out phonetically on a few of them. I know you have a bit of a background in Japanese culture, so if you want to th- come in, that's great. But so, I did not have the time to like go to a, a, a website fine. or YouTube and have them sound it out for me. I'll give you a quick rundown. So I need you listeners to understand that this is a bald white guy explains Japanese pronunciation to two other bald white guys. <laughs> so take this as it will, but... Simple way, when all else fails, if you have trouble pronouncing a name, fall back on this basic tenet. If there are two vowels in a row, mm-hmm. they're each separate syllables. Like Shinzaemon, it's not Shinzaemon, it's Shinzaemon. Okay. Uh, there are, uh, typically, typically in movies like this, you can put a pronunciation on the second syllable instead of the first. Okay. Shinzaemon, but I think he was an exception. Uh, I watch, I, I've picked all of this up from a lot of anime and i'm actually probably going to cut this whenever dusty hands me the final <laughs> bit because it's probably a little offensive but 
if you have I think a problem stay tonight, in. just say things like, look at everything as its own syllable. Okay. That That's a quick way to do it. Look at everything as its own syllable. Okay. Yeah. Or just grunt. Or just grunt. Because the whole movie. Was, <laughs> oh, yeah. it's oh, yeah. Anyway, you would, I was explaining. Uh, there's this part very early in the movie where uh doi says to he's talking to shinzaemon and he's offering him a job and shinzaemon yeah. says are you asking if i could do something yeah he was asking for a solid and that moment of hope of oh my god my life is about to have meaning again and then finally when he reveals the mutilated woman and her situation Shinzaemon laughs because he was uh, yeah I remember that part he now was hoping for a good he a good can, use he realizes that he a lifelong single purpose samurai somebody bred for battle for assassination and for honor can finally fulfill his destiny to die that's no that was a good yeah. bit I agree that look yeah, on no, his I, face that was good was just Oh, God, it brings tears. Just uh, each time I see that moment, it was intense. What you got, Dusty? <laughs> well, I didn't. Ha- there wasn't a lot to mine on this. Um, and a lot of going into, like, say, the cast, because uh, I haven't watched any other movie that any of these actors have been in. Um, so I'm probably not going to go too far into that. I don't think you've seen a lot of those movies. Nathaniel may have. Um, Maybe. But I, I didn't really cultivate towards that uh but uh yeah so the cast we'll start there uh actually this movie has a lot of tropes in it if you notice there's a (laughs) ton of stereotype tropes in it but eh, whatever and the kill count is high it's 222 so uh, that's about right if uh, if you like keeping score it's 222 deaths in this movie so uh out of 222 deaths how would you rate this movie (laughs) That's actually not a bad idea. We, um, we can take it on how many people die in each movie. John Wick's going to just destroy us. Yeah, John Wick. I, I, <laughs> oh, I, no, 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 no. Not I as the rating one. system, just as the number we use to rate it on. I, I, so somebody, this is going to be a tangent thing here. Somebody had posted one of those memes of you're going to die, people are coming to get you, and you can choose one of these like yeah, yeah. nine people. And so because I, I, was, I was working from home, I had nothing else to do. All my work was done. I went out to each of those actor characters and looked at their movies, the, the movies that they were, that was a specific scene from. Mm-hmm. And I broke down mathematically, like who should be the one next to you. And it was John wick because one movie, yeah. cause like one of them was James Bond. So over every James Bond movie, how many deaths were there? There's like 33 deaths in like all of the James Bond movies. Whereas John wick has one movie and he has like some 250 deaths. You want John wick next to you. I want Conan at my side. Conan does never abandons a friend, and his friends always live. Yeah. No, 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 no. Valeria. The, Valeria died. Yeah. Oh, that was a lover. That's not. That's different. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's different. Oh, Ouch. oh, and cut into a break. <laughs> <laughs> that is different. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> so, Matthew, we, we need to have a chat while we're at this break. About, yes. About getting rid of lovers. That's not. Not wise. Hmm. We can't talk about that. All right, so we're back from our break. Wait, no, what? I, I was kidding. It was a bad joke. <laughs> so we have, uh, uh, again, I'm going to apologize on the pronunciation. I, I am white. I'm bad an joke. American. And uh, sometimes words oh, are hard. Just, just do your best. Yeah, so uh, Goro Inagaki as Lord Matsudaria uh, Neret, Neret, Neret Suga. Sugu. Not at Sugu. Yeah, uh, that's the bad guy. Yes. Uh, Very bad. He uh, did the violent atrocities in this land, and they had gone unpunished since he is portrayed by the Shogun, who is his half brother. So his alignment, <laughs> obviously, we—I mean, obviously in the evil realm, but I'd say chaotic evil. Yeah, yeah. he was. A I, I, I don't have anything I mean, to yeah. to say no when to he, that. Way. When he killed um, that guy's kid and called him, you know, the, the monkey bones. Yeah. Br- takes a while to break. That was brutal. Yeah, I mean, he just it was no, like a good sociopath. five hacks. Yeah, no. Yeah, and then with direct eye contact, unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then at the end, when he when he lopped off uh, his like right hand guy's head, just yeah, <laughs> or kicked it, not not lopped off, but he kicked it, 
And that was, I even I was a little offended at that point. I was like, oh man, you kicked your dude's head, yeah, like a soccer ball. Well, there's there are some people to whom other people just aren't real. Yeah, yeah, you know. And he he did that very well. The actor portrayed that fantastically. And then we have uh, Miki Jiro Hira as Sir Doi Toshitsura. Uh, he was the senior advisor to the Shokunet Council. And he was alarmed uh, that the bad guy, I'm not going to try to do the name again, had been considered by the Shogun for a political position on the council. Uh, he's the one that actually had hired uh, Shin Zemon to kill the bad guy beforehand. So We don't see much of him, but I will give him lawful neutral. I was going to go with chaotic good. The, 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 the Shogun's agent? Yeah. Chaotic? Yeah. But, okay, so... He's breaking the rule of law. We've had this we've, we've had this argument yeah. because in uh, Sneakers, yeah. I can't kill my friend. You kill my friend. And you were very adamant about that. I, I think he was lawful. And I was... And I, and I had kind of flipped on that yeah. on another episode, and you got upset at me for that. Yeah. He and this is the like same... When I'm right! And this no, is the I, same I, thing, I, because I, he's I, like, I can't kill this... I can't kill my friend... Can you do me a solid and you go kill my friend for me? Ooh, he's right. But this guy wasn't his friend. He was a danger to the to the country. I don't but think he, he was doing good or he bad. He even said, I, I can't he's do right. this. But yeah. he also said multiple times, I can't do this, so can you go do this for so me? So you need to understand a little bit about that kind of court system. Mm-hmm. About Incidentally, let me of, bust in here. Of honor. That is a sick fucking yeah. society. It's a sick fucking that society. That is not a good, healthy yeah. society and it is not to be fucking admired. Every like the looks on people's okay, that point where Naritsugu is trying to cross the river and that other lord is standing him down, yeah, and he fucking says nothing yeah. because he knows if he opens his mouth, he is going to say something damning, even worse than his current situation, or he's gonna fuck it up or he's gonna waver. So, all he can do is stand this guy down, hope this guy doesn't try to kill him, and then when the guy leaves, he can kill himself to preserve his honor. Like that fucking Bushido. Yeah, that I didn't. I didn't get sick. that. I, I really didn't understand that. But and not only that, but they're they're peasants. I mean, a medieval serf under a horrific, horrific lord had more rights than the average Japanese serf. Mm-hmm. I mean, this samurai. I, I, I find absolutely nothing admirable about this no, culture. Not at all. This samurai, particular, excuse me, this particular time in that culture. Samurai possessed a Japanese equivalent of what we would call the noblesse oblige. But it was called the kirisute gomen, which, which you can kind of... Quant- okay, there's layers upon layers to this, but you can kind of quantify it in Western terms as the right to kill anybody anytime for any reason, even if they just offend you or if they look at you wrong. Because you were legally mandated to carry a weapon and dispense the justice and honor of your lord. So, yeah, you're right. Peasants meant nothing to these yeah. people. I mean, this this was a... Su- <laughs> yeah. I'm so angry I can't talk. This was a <laughs> sick society. So, back to, back to Doi. I would say lawful neutral because, first off, Naritsugu wasn't his friend. And second, he cared more about his country than anything else. He was doing all of this to preserve the balance. He felt that the shogun appointing his half-brother was a frivolous gesture, and he needed to prevent that from happening to preserve the balance of the country. He wasn't willing to do it himself because, again, it's like, this is a system of honor. I can't show that I am doing this, but I know people who can, and I can use the subsystem that is legally authorized as long as you either die or kill yourself in the process because that makes it cool. <laughs> That's fucked, fucked up. up. It's a fucked up <laughs> system. I, I, just a note on yeah. that. Uh, I, I'll go along with your... I didn't see enough of him to really form an opinion, so I'll just okay. take yours. The Foley in this? Mm-hmm. Oh, That's wonderful. <laughs> all, all the... <laughs> As they cut through their bowels, <laughs> it's just <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> so, cutting Dusty, we we had this conversation shortly ago as we were talking, getting ready for this episode. You were not really familiar with the concept of seppuku, are you? I, I I've heard it through friends. I have one of my one of my longtime friends in in Phoenix, who's also another game designer, mm-hmm. uh, who did the World of Dew, Ben Ben Werner. Um, he he's really big into this culture and. So much so, as much as I love him, Ben, I love you. He'll go into it when I do see him, 
when I go into Phoenix and I I just glaze over because it's too much. It's like me talking about cars or you know, to like my buddy Mike, who when I start talking about cars, he just glazes completely. Uh and then there's you and and then uh I have a, another couple of friends that can go into it, but yeah, I, I oh I'm and, glazed and, right now. And and Joe, because he lived in, in Japan for a few years, he'll talk about it, about the the honor and the culture behind it. How tall is Joe? 511 was he big in Japan tonight oh uh, <laughs> so seppuku or harakiri is this method of killing yourself yeah, essentially but, but that i but get but to redeem your name in social standing okay so for example the the guy who at the very beginning of the movie kills himself mm-hmm. he kills himself as an act of rebellion to make an honorable act of rebellion that legally should have no repercussions against his family because he chose a path of honor. Cutting one's own stomach open was not only an honorable way to die, it was sort of considered the most manly fucking way to die. Well, like, okay, because I oh, know... you got big fucking cojones if you can yeah, take a knife to Yeah, because I do belly. know that you, 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 you take the... You take the blade, you insert it on one side, and the only way, the only thing that I really know about this from, from what I've, I do know about it is that the only way you can keep your honor is you, you insert it, you go across one way, up, and then back over to make like a rectangle, and if you can pull it out, then you're basically, your honor is intact. That's kind of a complicated way of looking at it, but essentially you shove a knife in your stomach and can cut across. And if you are wealthy enough or honorable enough to have friends, you might have somebody serve as your second, mm-hmm. and their job it's is to, to cut your head off you, yeah. before you suffer too much. It's considered an honorable relief. Seriously, a belly uh, gut yeah. wound is never... But if you don't have a second, that's when you do the up and back over, which is considered double manly. <laughs> like, it is essentially the, the most of manly way to a, die a in this knife movie. in your, in your yeah. what, femoral artery and turning it. But the reason it is so honorable is, is that in the culture, by taking one's own life in a political way, you save your family from disgrace so how well did that work in the movie well here's the problem with that is narsuku was a fucking villain yeah Mm -hmm. he killed that guy's family yeah and you saw his aides be like you should leave them alone they are off limits yeah they became a pincushion for very large arrows but no his what's his name uh the aide i've already forgot it uh dio doi sorry or uh yeah, Hanbei. Oh, okay. Hanbei's like, no, they're off limits. I like you Hanbei. cannot do this, and he's like, I don't fucking care. I do it up, motherfucker. <laughs> I would have liked Hanbei more if at the very end they'd gone. You know what? You're right, <laughs> and they both turned around and got him. <laughs> <laughs> That's an American way of doing it. Unfortunately, that didn't happen this time. That's why we win. So that was <laughs> Doi. <laughs> mm-hmm. Who else you got? And then we team? have uh, Koji Yakusho, who played uh, Shinzemon. Who was the war weary, decorated samurai who believed that there, there is much more to Bushido than the, just the strict blind obedience to it. Was he the guy at the end? The uncle of the other guy? No, he was the older one that got everyone together. Ah. He was trembling when I, my life has meaning okay. again. So, uh. But yes, he was the other guy's uncle. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's the one that assembled the group, uh, to plot the ambush. Uh, for for the bad guy going from Ido to Akashi, Ak- Akashi. Is that, I don't know how to pronounce that. Akashi. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, I lawful good. I would say lawful good. Agreed. Okay. Yeah. I All would right. say most people fell in the lawful good category. I think honestly. most of the assassins, yeah. with the exce- with the exception of the hunter, the demon. Most of the assassins fell into lawful good. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I know, uh, <laughs> right? It's that again. This is why I love this setting, this theme, this period of time as a gaming material mm-hmm. because it's so inspirational. It is a culture very alien to our own as Westerners that is ripe for for ideas, for inspiration. Uh, then we have Hiroki Mat- Matsukata, who played Sah- Sahida, the who played second in command to Shinzaemon, who was another veteran samurai who had volunteered his best and most trusted students for the mission. So just remind me, I, f- I forget a lot of their names. He was the one who said, who was like, I am ashamed that I have not already paid my debt to you. 
Yes. Was that, yeah. yeah. Was that the one who later in the movie was like, okay, get behind me and kill anyone that makes it past me? Yeah, God, that guy. Because it's on screen right Oh, yeah, now. that guy. Yeah, that, that guy's a fucking badass. Uh, yeah. He's probably the most badass person in the no, movie. No, 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 no. That guy was the Ronin. He's the next guy. Wait, what? Kujiro. Really? That's the Ronin. That's that's the Ronin. Uh, unmatched swordsmanship who had trained under Shin Zeman. The second in command was the other older guy. Oh, the other guy. older guy. Yeah, the other older guy. Oh, he was really funny. He yeah. was cool. He was kind of the friar tuck. Pretty much. <laughs> so then rounding into uh, Suyoshi Ihara yeah. as Kujiro. He was the, like I just said, the Roman, the Ronin, uh, who was the... The like, Roman? The Roman. <laughs> um, <laughs> who, who was the, uh, you know, unquestionable... Un- he was the best so- swordsman out of the entire group. Absolutely. That- I love when he just shows up in the middle of the night, like... His students walking home and mm-hmm. some assassins jump him, and this dude's like, "I'm a Ronin. I will help you." Chuck, 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 chuck. <laughs> yes. My my favorite my favorite scene with him was uh, when he he got he made uh, everyone follow him and his his buddy into the area where you see all the swords that are just like stuck into oh, yeah. the ground like and that the post, scene. and he's just. Picking up sword after sword, one gets used, drops it. Poems, yeah, one gets used, dro- gets stuck in right someone there, else. Actually, yeah. Grab another one that's right yep. by and just keep going. It was, it was Beautiful. a, it's what I think a whirlwind attack would actually be in real life. So, <sighs> I would. All right, neutral. I'm going to do this. What? That particular style of sword play mm-hmm. is just awful. Oh, from this movie, I, I, I understand that. It's about the honor, mm-hmm. and their whole culture is based on honor and face and name and rank. Yeah, but we're not putting any of that down. Uh, as a as a, a a filthy classless white American, <laughs> you could have a hidden in one of those numerous trees that encroach so close on the road and just shot the fucker who yeah. stands up higher than anyone else. Yeah. B, you have the explosives. Just yeah. blow him up. <laughs> But that has nothing to do with the sword play. You're talking about the general strategy of the encounter oh, itself. Oh, my God. Every time someone left themselves open, I was like, oh, no. Okay. Now, I have no comments on the sword play, but I will with mooks, agree with on you. On the other hand. At one point in the movie, in the battle, mm-hmm. they have everybody trapped, and they fucking throw their bows down. No! Yeah. No! No! You just fucking keep yeah. fucking shooting them. Yeah, you, you have arrows. <laughs> like, I, I don't know why it's okay sometimes and why it's not okay other times. You can blow up that bridge. You certainly can't blow up the bridge with him on it. You can shoot arrows at him, but you can't shoot arrows at him in the forest. Well, what I, mean, I didn't what I didn't understand is they, they got everybody in this town into... Oh, and fuck it, the villagers, it, right? Hang, hang on, hang on. <laughs> so they got, they got, every, they, they got everybody into the town square. They, they, bl- they, they blocked everything off. So one, why didn't they stay up on the rooftops and just arrow everyone? Yes, to death? that right there. Two, why didn't they just layer litter the ground with the the um, the, uh, the the flame accelerant that they that the one guy used? The guy I think drunk they had into limited quantities. Is and what it was. three, they apparently had a lot of explosives. Not so many. why didn't they? No, they had they blew up the whole big house. The centerpiece of the entire town. Because they blew it up. then you can't take 16,000 wounds and keep fighting. A la V for Dusty. Vendetta. Yeah, the, I Dusty. was going to bring that up to later. <laughs> Dusty. Wasn't it cool? Oh, it was cool, but... So, okay, what do you mean okay, 16, wait, wait, hang on, hang on, Most hang of the on. people died from one or two. Hang on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Um, so, as a... We've, we, we're all gamers here. Um, this movie would have been... Th- that whole sequence would have been done and over with in like 15 minutes of gameplay because everyone would be like we no, have explosives what are you talking about? we have explosives uh-uh. we have flame accelerants and we have bow and arrows i don't think you've ever actually played a combat in an rpg yes i have combat in that's an RPG insulting come on is 15 seconds of, of action that's insulting. that takes place um, yeah. across five sessions Nathaniel, of play <laughs> you, you know that i have and yeah every game i've ever played whenever you get a combat with that many combatants it does you're playing time. it for like no, I which is why it takes time. I, I call them mooks yeah. the, and this system would work for that Oh, yeah. That you were speaking of, you know, all, yeah. all the time, because these guys existed to be slaughtered. Yeah, they were just there to be killed. But you have explosives. You have. Oh, I agree completely. You have a, a fuel to light on fire, and they use it. That would not have to. They're all cloistered into a small area. This would have been done and over with in a matter of moments. 
It looked cool, though. I know it looked cool. It's a but... samurai movie. So I, I would have burned them too. I it's did a okay. D and D session with a buddy of mine a long time ago, yeah. and part of the 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 quest was the villagers had a dragon that had been terrorizing the town, right? Okay, and it was our duty to go in and slay the dragon. GM wasn't going to really let us do this. It was a time involved. So what he he used uh he got a hold of an army and had them go destroy the dragon for everybody. Game was that that session was done and over with in like twenty minutes. Game over. That's kind of the same thing with this. So when you get together for a game and you run a game and you're like, okay, I've got this adventure and the players want to go kill it and I want the players to go kill a dragon. Mm -hmm. The players are like, all right, cool. I'm going to get together. We're going to get together and we're going to kill a dragon. And then you have those assholes in the group who are like, okay, we're going to apply modern year 2000 plus years of military tactics against this. We're going to do these things. We're going to actually be sensible. We're not going to fucking play the game we're going to just butt fuck the dm that's no fun however <laughs> even i as a player sometimes i'll see through it i'll be like okay i see i see how i can destroy this and then i will not get to play anymore because i will have solved the campaign in one hour of play yeah and i will have destroyed my ability to keep playing and having fun because i know that the gm has only prepared this thing but if you have Okay, so like with this, and I know we're tangenting on this, if they already have, it's, it's been established, you, you too, they were specifically said, you too, go train with explosives. So they have an abundant amount to where they can oh, train no, no, and no, get no, rid no, no, of. no, 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 I think you were vastly overestimating the amount of explosives that they had. Where do you think they got it in Fuel Japan? Just, just let me know. I don't Where? know exactly. How many explosives <laughs> do you think they had? How much you only gasoline? Need one when they're on a bridge. How much? There's that too. And they yeah. blew the bridge up. Yeah, but too late. <laughs> they were what do you mean too late? Well, you you rig it, it for when he's crossing. Yeah, it. exactly. Oh, I think they rigged it so they could trap them in and have fun murdering them because they're samurai and you face your enemy. <laughs> Again, it's this whole honor thing. I have I such get... a hard time with this. Yeah, get... so do I. But it was fucking cool. <laughs> it was cool okay. looking, yeah. But I'm looking at it like logistically. Let's save the explosives for everybody in the same area. Blow them all up. So then we also have uh, Suyoshi Ihara. Oh, that was that was the Ronin. Okay, uh, Takayuki Yamada. Uh, he played Shinrokuro, uh, who was Shinzimon's nephew, who had strayed from Bushido. And he became the game gambler and the womanizer who was bored and ashamed, and he joined the mission to redeem himself. I liked himself. him. I liked yeah, him. so did I. I, I. I especially liked his ending. I liked when he left his wife. The 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 subtext that was going yeah. on between them, where she was like, "No, don't go," because I know what you're going to die. What is up with that face paint? I can't. I explain had nothing it. to do with what I was talking about, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that was a good scene. All right. No, it was a good scene. Um, and and just the whole "I'm going to go die" just. Don't even wait for me, basically. Because I'm a fucking samurai. But the face paint, yeah, it it was distracting. Yeah. Maybe it's because I've I've like Americanized, you know, Memoirs of a Geisha and 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 other movies. It just it seemed almost on like par with Japanese horror movies. Yeah, almost. So culturally do you have any idea what that's all about it made sense i mean are they supposed to be like indoors and pale or something what's well i think it's implying that his and i don't even i don't think that was his wife i think we were just saying it was a girl that he was yeah. with but it's implying because that she was she near was. the painted I think was, geisha seat yeah sequence. i think she was little more than just a girl because there's, there seemed to be a lot of indications about her standing being yeah low yeah and then, I, I really can't comment on that's okay. I was just curious if you knew Japan. I'm just not going to go there. Uh, Yusuke Isiera, uh, who was Kiga Kyoto, <laughs> he was the hunter who was found suspended in the I liked uh, him. yeah. Uh, the the uh, movie desperately needed him. He was a foil. He yeah. was the wild he was wild card. Yeah, bitches. he was he was the the supernatural imp, and I liked it. And, he was, and, a de- and he was, once again, yeah. Once again, if someone suffers. comes at me with a rock for a sock and <laughs> yeah, uh, once, I mean, uh, it, yokai, yokai, is that how you pronounce it? Y o yokai or yeah, y-o-k-a-i. either a yokai or a noni, depending upon okay. your perception of it. I think so. You guys didn't watch the special Japanese edition with so the, the butt international. Sex, you said. Ed- yeah. no. the international edition was trimmed down, and there 
most of what was trimmed down were scenes involving him mm-hmm. in lewd acts or doing awful things implicating his existence as being a demon. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. So in this, he's just a weird guy. He's just a yeah, weird guy. Like like guy. He yeah. does have these like weird these uh, fantasies of his wife. Yeah, there were there were a couple that there were yeah. a couple scenes that cut to his wife, and he would talk about his wife. Yeah, and but it wasn't his wife. Oh. It was his boss's wife. Yeah, I, I, he's lying. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so this movie was directed by Takashi uh, Miki Mika Mika. All right. Uh, Mika. I, just, I think everybody just says Mika. I could be pronouncing it wrong. Okay. Uh, he had been a fan of uh, Koji Yakusho's acting, and he had made it a priority that he was in the cast in the leading role. Uh, in addition, he had sought younger actors to play the other assassins, in particular uh, Takaoka and Yamada, with whom Mickey, Mikey, eh, sorry, had worked in two other films. Uh, you had commented, I think, about one of them, Crow Zero and Crow Zero Two. Maybe. I've never seen that one. Oh, I thought maybe you no. did. Okay. So. Uh, the ones I was talking about were Ichi the Killer, which is one that I wanted to put on the list, but given your actions to the... I don't think I'm going to... I'll watch it. I'll pretty much watch okay. any movie, so... It's, it is... It's okay. Mika is... We watched Nightbreed, and we talked about David Cronenberg. Okay, is it going to be Nightbreed level of bad? No, Mika is... I, I personally think a much better director than Cronenberg. Uh, people are going, I'm sorry if you're angry at this statement, <laughs> listeners, but I think he's a better director than Cronenberg. He is essentially the Japanese version, really big on body horror and fucked up kind of stuff like that. Like, it, like the Foley that you were talking about, that's something. That was a, first, yeah, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll say was, this is some of the yeah. best Foley yeah. I have ever heard. Yeah. Every rustle of every movement was captured perfectly yeah he is really well known for his body horror i i as much as i hated the beginning of this movie i would have really liked to have seen it in the theater just so i could get the full effect of of that sound design because it was amazing i i have nothing but praise for that yeah i especially with the swords the the metal on metal that sounded amazing i really like that when they drew them out of the wooden sheaths they didn't go ring yeah i know they went yeah, they they sounded like they were being pulled out of pulled wood. Out of wood, yeah. right? Yeah, which was good. Um, so Swords yeah. don't sound like pipes being hit together, kids. No. They really, really don't. Uh, screenplay was written by uh, Kaneo Igiyami and based on the screenplay by Sochirio Ikimia. Now, this is a remake of a movie which was done in like 1963. So I never saw the original. Neither, neither yeah. have I. I um, bet they didn't have quadruple amputees naked. I'm gonna have to go back and watch the original now. I want to see. That being said, a hugely powerful part of this oh, yeah. was when they're standing after shooting all their arrows. No, not all their arrows. Oh, and just deciding yeah. to drop it. And he holds up that thing that says yeah. Total, Massacre. Total Massacre. I was like, now, after having such a hard time with this movie, I went, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Chekhov's yeah. calligraphy, man. It was... <laughs> That was an ass. It, yeah, the look on his was. face too. Of, yeah, it's time, yeah. motherfucker. Yeah, yeah. There, there was, there was a lot. But was, <clears throat> I, I do apologize for what I wrote <laughs> because <laughs> I had such. I, I can't emphasize. You this had a knee jerk reaction. I was like, "The fuck is wrong with you? Why am I watching this? Why don't you just put on prescribed horror porn? This is <laughs> awful." And then the movie started, and I was, like, "Oh." <laughs> oh, well, I like that. Oh, they're gonna go fuck, fuck that you. guy up. But, but I like that. Oh, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> oh, oh, that was that was well done. And then I got into the movie. But god damn, that was a rough start. I, I did like the uh um we're here to buy your 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 town, you know, to be able to use yeah. to, to 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 block off and not let the not let the, the bad guy go through and the guy's like, Well, maybe, I don't know and and he's like, well, here's our deposit. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> he just <laughs> fell over. <laughs> thought that was great. Although I did, the things that I had put in our, our chat about this movie, about the, my beat for beats, uh, you know, right. when I was watching the movie, I, th- I thought was pretty funny, actually. Especially the needs <laughs> more lightsaber sounds. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I know you think that's funny, mm-hmm. but Star Wars started I, as a uh, fucking samurai movie. Yeah, I know. I know. And to the point that irks me seeing the modern takes on the star wars jedi that's just laser ninjas 
But really, like the concept in the first movie, that sword wasn't drawn unless someone's about to die. Whereas in the prequel trilogy, it's just all lightsabers all the time. Woo! Lightsaber raves! Ah, oh, God. <laughs> I'd go to that. Yeah, I would too, probably. <laughs> probably wouldn't come back home, but... <laughs> So the movie did begin shooting in July 2009 on a large open air set in, again, sorry, uh, Suruka in the Yamagata prefecture in northern Japan. Uh, the filming of the action scenes actually took about three weeks, which were really good action sequences. I, I actually will... want to talk about some of the static shots. Okay. Um, there was some excellent use of sliders and prime lenses mm-hmm. here. Yeah, they're all oh, got really their really soft foreground. Mm-hmm. Like there's a scene where, uh, they're sitting in a darkened room, and they're speaking to each other. Was that in the beginning and when he was, telling, was telling the about the the son and the daughter? And, yeah, yeah, and there's all these writing utensils in the foreground, and mm-hmm. they're all really soft. And in the background is this fantastic, fantastic piece of just uh, the rice tapestry wall. Yeah, um, which was a uh, like a starry night mm-hmm. set against bamboo, and they do this really slow pan from right to left. And it was just a fantastic bit of cinematography. And there was a lot of that. I completely agree. I, I don't think they used like really good cameras or had a huge budget or anything. Because the budget of, was fairly minimal. Yeah, a lot of it was was off, but what they used they had uh, what they had they used like masters. The cinematography in this was fantastic and I have nothing but praise for it. The scene between Hanbei and Shinzaman when Shinzaman is talking with his crew back at home, back at the headquarters, and Hanbei just shows up and calls him out. And the two of them have a chat on the, the outside walkway. Uh-huh. The The cinematography there was gorgeous. Oh, there, there wasn't a part of and it that I didn't like. Every the, bit of it was good. There was a part of that scene that was just silence. Yeah. Of the two of them staring each other down for like 10 seconds yeah just not saying a word from a it's gorgeous from a technical standpoint this was one of the best movies i've ever seen technical on the technical side yeah i will yeah. agree with that there's a lot that i loved on the technical side there's a lot story-wise that i didn't like some of that's just me being an american and i just don't get it that's just part of me just being also being an asshole oh well i we said american right <laughs> <laughs> well there are there are friends wah, of mine that, that that say i am a film snob I think you're a film snob, Dusty. But I also really like, you know, the Scorpion King 1, 2, 3, and 4. So I don't really know if that puts me... Maybe 4? Yeah. Wow. I think 4. So that, that can't really put me into being a film snob. Like We all slum sometimes. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I No, but I, I just want to reiterate. Technically, this is one of the best movies I'd ever seen. The direction, the cinematography, the sound design, the costuming... Uh, the location scout, mm-hmm. whoever did that. I mean, it was not, not bad for a seventeen and a half million dollar movie. Are you shitting me? Nope, that's how much it was. USD seventeen point five million dollars. Nicely done. Yeah. Now I I don't like the era, I don't like the time, and I don't like the subject. I don't but, like a lot of the logic with it either. But for what it was, it was fucking amazing. So I love samurai movies. I, I love it. Anything that would have taken me out of it would have would have been very bad and internally it was very consistent i loved the way the villain died in the end this is this is pain yeah people feel like this but he didn't have the realization of oh i've done wrong he stayed a villain to the end it was so good the the only thing that really took me out of the movie was was the score a couple of times there, there were was some, a score I yeah there was notice. there were some pieces of music that weren't really for the area that they were in, and it kind of it kind of detracted because I me. thought it was it was silent most of the time. Oh, there was a loud score. This score is probably the most played soundtrack in my entire music collection. Hmm. Okay, yeah, I actually listened to this heavily when writing both of my last games. V and V Nation is my yeah. heaviest. I love this right score. now for writing the book I'm currently yeah. writing. It's the uh, Mass Effect Andromeda soundtrack hmm. and Selfless soundtrack. Of that and the Halo theme song, of course. Selfless is a, is a, is a Ben Kingsley, Ryan Reynolds sci-fi movie. Ooh, Ben Kingsley? Yeah. Sir Ben Kingsley? Yes, yeah, Sir, Sir Ben, ben Kingsley. Kingsley. Yes. It's a decent movie. Awful evil. What, so full of crap. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> what, else, what, did, what, what are some of the other things that you really liked about the movie, Matthew? I, I think I've gone through it. I loved the rain. I loved the mud. And I loved how mm, they yeah. they wallowed in it. 
that they weren't clean. They were muddy. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they weren't shining knights in armor. They were muddy, determined men. And I love that. That's a good that. point, yeah. They, they were doing a dirty thing and thus were dirty. I loved that nobody when... Nobody was pretty and nobody was clean. I loved that when they finally lopped off the villain's head, it didn't roll down the street and stand looking up so the camera could zoom into their eyes. Oh, it just kind of yeah. bounced into the house and around the corner and was gone. gone. Yeah. <laughs> it was, in a lot of ways, it was, it was very real. It, it felt very real. It felt very... It felt primal and intimate. And once I got over my initial horror, I really enjoyed this movie. But it took me a while to get over it. Like a good hour. My my more liking for it was more on technical, uh, you know, just location, camera use. I mean, we've already talked about it fully. Yeah, uh, angles. The, the actors were great. Story wise, I liked it. I I see why you really like this movie. I do, and it is a good movie. But there's just some aspects of it that mine is the logic behind a lot of the decisions that uh, story wise were made. And what story? Go to this place and kill this dude. What more story do you need? I I can't do this, so do me a solid and go kill this for me. Politics, and, and I'm going to protest this, but not, but I can't actually do anything. So I'm going to commit murder, just, to, suicide. That is honestly, dude. And I mean, I'm not putting simply, it down. I'm not putting it down. I, I, that was a completely different culture. It's a completely different time. It was a different yes, era. I, I get it. I just as as a as a white. American sitting in 2017, almost 2018. I don't get the logic behind it. Dusty, things that you did like. Uh, I really did like the sword play in this movie. That was one thing that I liked. Um, I liked also from what little bit of knowledge I know about it. I liked seeing that when they went in, because there's a rule about drawing your sword in in this culture and this time frame. It and depends the, on the what... sword has to be upside down if it's if you're going in some place ah. to, to show so that depends... you're not being aggressive. It depends on the era, mm-hmm. and it depends on the style of samurai movie that you prescribe to. Mm-hmm. But this, ultimately, the, the katana and the the daisho, the katana mm-hmm. wakazashi pair, is worn bending down. Okay. However, the tachi of the former era. This one bending up. Okay. It depends on the, the sword itself. But samurai of this particular era, when you are casually wearing your weapon, you bend it down. And then you fold it out, mm-hmm. or not out, or around to draw it and to resheathe it, and then you okay. put it back down. There's one thing I found historically accurate, and that was there wasn't a lot of ringing sword play mm-hmm. because katanas and wakazashis snap like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's very bad, very bad. They iron are definitely and metal very and flesh bad weapons. steel. Yeah. You you do not block with either one of them. Hmm. You do not parry. You get out of the way. You kill. Yeah. yeah. Because they break like no one's business. One of the reasons that they fold those swords so many times mm-hmm. is because their steel is shit. Yeah. And they had to make up for that. Send your letters to Have Movies Will Game. Address them to Matthew and let him know if you are <laughs> part of the cult of the katana and how wrong you are. Your sword is shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to disagree. <laughs> it, but... That They're said, pretty. I'll match it any day against a saber. I'm not going to disagree. I'm mm, not going to yeah. agree. I'm not an expert of the blade, and I'm not one of those white people that worships katanas. Nah. That said, I think you know at least enough that they are blades designed to cut through fucking flesh. I think and if you're going to draw one and you are going to swing it, you are going to kill with it. I, I think a lot of white dudes that yeah. that grew up adoring katanas is, has nothing to do. With any historical value to and it, everything to do with Ninja Turtles. No, everything to do with fucking Highlander. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely, yeah, Highlander. Right. Because well, because Highlander Connor McCloud had Turtles. had had the had you know uh, the the katana with the dragon end on it with the ivory handle. It was a dragon, a dragon on the blade. Yeah, exactly. And then and then the TV show was the same. It was the same sword. Yeah. Duncan McCloud, yes. Clan McCloud, yes, who was a very Adrian distant, Paul. yeah, a very distant cousin to Connor McCloud and Clan McCloud. Anyway, black black Did duster jacket. Did we ever jacket. put that on the list? <laughs> Highlander. Why isn't Highlander on the list? Can you game it? Of course yeah, you, you can. can. Game Tell that. me how. How you the immortals struggling for power? Yeah. That's an eminently gameable thing. Okay, uh, uh, it's let's not, put it on the list. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. I mean, because you, yeah, you've How got you, miss that? you've got the Kurgan, you've got Connor, and you've got uh, the Kurgan who stole the movie. Um, in my opinion, yeah. Oh, what yeah. was what was Sean Connery's name? Um, the Highlander. The the no, he was Sean Connery played a Spaniard who was an Egyptian who was white. Um, because that's what I, you. I do. forgot his character's <laughs> name. Oh, uh, Sean Connery. <laughs> uh, so anyway, back to this movie. Who, who was married to a Japanese princess? Who her her father made made the sword? <laughs> no, that's that's the actual fucking canon for the, for the character. You remind me of the Sean. Which Sean? The Sean Connery. Which Connery? I don't know. From one of those movies at that time. <laughs> so the sword play I thought was really cool because again they didn't parry. Mm-hmm. They used the katana. They drew the katana and they tried to kill with it. Yeah, it wasn't. I'm going to block your attack because a lot of people, a lot of American directors. Or non-Japanese directors, I should say. Not just as American, but non-Japanese directors. Well, like, I'm going to make a movie and we're going to use katanas. They struggle they, edge to edge after trading blows. Tried, Fuck I that never noise. understood that. That's how you lose fingers. They yeah. try to make the katana into a Western fencing They try weapon. and make it into a broadsword is what they but do. Yeah, they go, no, uh, no, yeah, that's, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. But it's not. Or they even apply, like, fencing, like fencing techniques. Like, I want to parry and thrust. No, it's not parrying and thrust. It's a fucking kill. Yeah. Just mm-hmm. kill. <laughs> it's, swipe, uh, swipe, kill. Swipe, swipe, swipe kill. kill. With that Foley coming into play. Yeah. Poke, I win. But I, yeah. <laughs> Another shot that I really liked was the, the, the forest uh, nymph uh, getting killed. The mm-hmm. there yeah well, he was standing there talking about how samurais are useless and he doesn't like uh, so many in the town and then the 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 bad guy that I can't pronounce his name just throws his short sword right oh, in yeah, his yeah, throat yeah. and then he you know he dies he right there and then he comes back at the end of the movie <laughs> he's like are you immortal <laughs> <laughs> I love the Wikipedia description of it and what's his name who who survived somehow yeah. appears <laughs> <laughs> there is room if you miss the arteries I mean. But he had no hole. I mean, there was it was very. Oh, obvious. he did. No, when he yeah, came back he, at the, the end. No, 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 there no, was he, a wound at, at right the there. end. No, no, I don't yeah. think so. I can't correct either of you. I don't. I, don't know. Think, I, I, I don't was know. looking for it because I was like, "What the fuck?" I can just hit play. It's still going. <laughs> <laughs> Almost to that scene, you're like 20 minutes from it. I think that's what. No, I he, think that's he what the timer says. Yeah. I, I looked for it. I didn't see it because yeah. I was looking too. But I was also watching it. Like I said, I was two lunch breaks that I had to watch the movie on on this thing. When I first saw it, I actually got. I had followed the development of it online because I'm a nerd and I was expecting to see more with that character because I had read the website. Oh, they built him up too. Yeah. I was, I was read kinda... what I was expecting from him. So I knew he was kind of a supernatural character. I guess I just didn't look for that in that scene. I was just like, Oh, he's back. Of course he is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I thought, uh, I, I liked that character a lot. Um, I, I liked the foolish samurai cause it echoed exactly what I felt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I I had a hard time sus, uh, engaging the world mm-hmm. because I it doesn't answer to logic. It only answers to honor and face. Yeah. Two things which I don't really care about. I care about effectiveness and conservation of resources, <laughs> you know, and yeah, I can see that. this this whole world is is uh, is odd to me. I would not have done well in feudal Japan. Have you never played a. Uh... Ancient Japan, no, I actually have RPG no. like D and D Oriental. I, Adventures. No, I was gonna so say I, I played D and D Oriental Adventures. No, it's not actually bad. No, the, it, it is. D one. It was that. Well, I mean, that book itself was the first for a number of D and D subsystems. Mm-hmm. But going back and reading it, it's not that bad. There's, I've, there's I've a few things it, which you can I've look at and think it. of a kind of racist at the time, but it actually did a good job of creating a new culture based on cultural ideals. Yeah. And it was. What for it, for what it was wasn't so bad. I played um oh, for a are. while heavily uh, Vampire Kindred of the East. Oh, with the Cathayans. Yeah, which is yeah. basically just Japanese vampires with a lot of supernatural yeah. powers. I, kind of bas- basically yeah. low pan more, from Big Trouble in Little my, China. My yeah, fan of Japanese definitely. culture is more giant mecha and less yeah. samurai. Yeah. I like giant mecha too. Yeah, yeah I, um, like a lot. I, I like giant monsters. I like I also, giant mecha. A like specific room on our horror. list. <laughs> it, it is somewhere yeah, on there. Okay. We've talked about it. We've yeah. we've toyed with it. I also I'm a I like Japanese horror because American horror just sucks. I'm not a fan of horror. No one ever picks you know, up the what's machete. What's funny though is that the American versions of Japanese horror movies I think are better than the originals. Like The Ring is way better than Ringo. 
And mm-hmm. The Grudge is way better than Juwan. Just give me one second. Think off the top of my head. I'm sure there are others. I tend to watch comedic horror. I'm not the guy to ask. Ah, okay. Yeah. Comedic Kevin horror. Woods. Yeah. So good. Shaun so good. of the Dead. Yeah. Evil Dead, the entire. Tucker yeah. and Dale versus Evil. I think my favorite character from this movie would actually be Shinzaman. The older I get, the more I appreciate movies about older heroes. Video games about older heroes. Animes about older heroes. Stories where the world isn't saved by a group of fucking teenagers. And Shinzaman is like, to me... <laughs> fucking word, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shinzaman, to me, it's like he's lived his life. He was settling down. He was doing nothing but fishing the rest of his life. And now he has purpose. And I can, I God, can I appreciate love that fishing that. scene, too. Yeah, that was a good fishing scene. Yeah. It really was. I don't really have a basis of appreciation of fishing scenes, but it was good. <laughs> oh, just, just the way it was shot. Yeah. Um, they didn't use the comic relief too badly. He slipped and went down once. Yeah. And, but them just sitting there on a, on a gray sea, just yeah. silently casting out into the water on this weird fucking was like some hut of Baba Yaga yeah, yeah. looking fucking stool. <laughs> I mean, it yeah. was, it was really cool. It was it really was cool. well done. My, f- I think my favorite character was, and I forget his name, but he, when he when he came into the group, he wanted the basically the three hundred gold pieces. The up Ronin, front. he yeah. wanted two hundred Ryu. He's my hero. Yeah, I liked him because when they were talking to him, because he was the older guy, and, you know, he they, they were talking to him about, you know, he's like, well, I've got some lifelong debt that I need to pay off, you know, the tomb for my wife, preparations for me. And then they were like, well, what are you going to do with the, about the rest? And it was like, I'm going to go have the experiences that I never got to have. <laughs> and then it was like, and I'm pretty good. Go hit the house and get drunk. Yeah. Really. And he's like, and I'm pretty good with a spear. And he, like, the scenes where he was focused oh, right, on with the, the spear, spear. There was one. Was I great. didn't have a problem with that. Why? Well, when you, uh, that was one bit of bad foley. And it was, it, it was so bad uh, it stood totally. out. It was, a, it was a wooden spear. Oh, and yeah. he kept catching swords on it. And yeah, they would make that metallic sharpening noise. Yeah, I heard that too. And that's not how that works. It either. had a metal head. At one yeah, point, but he it, when he catches the, it and yeah, the he, shaft he, he, and it oh, scrapes down, it goes. Gotcha. Yeah, you know this oh, this yeah, sharpening yeah. knife thing. Okay, I'm with you. But that was the only one. Mm-hmm. And so many movies do so horribly on that that I am willing to forgive that. There's a line in the movie about Shinzaman, and it is from uh, Hanbei. When Hanbei is describing very early in the movie, mm, yeah, describing I, I know what you're talking about. It's great. He's talking about him, and the line is, "He's not as shrewd and he's not as strong." Oh, right, more, but he's dangerous. But it concludes yeah. with, "But he's a man who beats you in the end." Yeah. What would you say, Hen- Henba? Hanbei? Hanbei. Hanbei. What would you Hanbei. say his alignment was? We never got to him. I um, would say, off and neutral. Yeah, because that whole the whole speech he gave at the end about you know honor and duty and dying for your body doesn't matter if we disagree with it or yeah. not that this is what what we're we're born to do. That's yeah, Bushido. Yeah, that that was told lawful neutral, total. Yeah, I think he was one of my favorite characters, honestly, because he was yeah. serving a bad master, but he was serving him well. I hated his helmet. I hated all their headgear. It was yeah. So annoying. <laughs> There's, yeah, but it's period. <laughs> it's just that's you know different cultures. Different you figure ways, island styles. island place. They don't. Yeah. They have the resources they have. Yeah, but at the same they also time, have a shitload of rain. So all of their helmets. Oh yeah, have that designed to slick yeah. it down. Yeah. Just yeah. built yeah, I in get that. Yeah, but I mean, they don't have leather. They don't have cows. Why are they tied with cloth? <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. Um, but you know, some some of that's just me and my inability to understand i guess i will say hanbei probably had the shittiest job because he seemed to be a man of honor and he knew that his boss was very dishonorable and he even explains it in that yeah. scene mm-hmm. where he he and shinzaman are talking it's like you did this and i did this and i saw this opportunity and i took it and now i'm fucked yeah <laughs> shit no I, I you got the feeling he was looking for death yeah uh, but yeah. he was looking for an honorable death. He he got within it. his culture, and I really liked them pulling each other onto the swords to get at one another. Mm-hmm. That was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, <sighs> and then God, and then pushing brutal. off. Yeah, and then leaving the blood on, blood yeah. hand on his on his face. It was <sighs> beautiful. God, that scene is like <laughs> it's like crack to me. Like that scene inspired me so much for the games 
that we're going to talk about in a minute. Well, I don't I don't have anything else to say about this. You guys good? I'm good. <laughs> Cheers. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll get into the gaming aspect. Hi, everyone. This is your favorite host, Matthew. This week's episode is brought to you by Guardian Games, who we are proud to have as our sponsor. Guardian Games is Portland's largest gaming store. They have almost every game you can think of, be it role-playing, board game, card games, miniature games, even video games. They also have a ton of gaming-related material and some pretty neat swag. I mean, the D20 fuzzy dice that go in your mirror, that's good stuff. If, you, uh, <laughs> if you're 21, uh, you can have a drink in the back at the Critical Sip. Booze makes gaming better. Always has, always will. There's free games back there. You'll love it. Uh, they also have a friendly and incredibly knowledgeable staff, and they are the hub of a diverse and friendly gaming community. Um, if you're in Portland, you definitely want to go to Guardian Games. The way of the samurai is morning after morning, the practice of death. Considering whether it will be here or be there, imagining the most slightly way of dying, and putting one's mind firmly in death. Yamamoto Sunitomo, Hagakure. Samurai games are about mortality. I think if you're going to run a true samurai-themed game, death needs to always be on the table. So yeah. welcome back. We're talking about <laughs> the gaming aspect of things, obviously. So, Dusty, mm -hmm. Matthew, hmm. what about this movie do you find inspiring for games? When they're preparing the town, I've done that. It was a I've whole, straight up done that. That's a whole A-team montage right there. Yeah. It really is. Uh, the, yeah. the setting of Accurate traps. Accurate description. The, uh, the repurposing of the area you find yourself uh, to further your goals. Um, using what's there yeah, and hoping for the best. Yeah. That's a good one. I like that. Um, I like that it was a hopeless scenario, but they went for it anyway. Okay. Yeah. And, it was, it was uh, a, this is Sparta. Yeah. Yeah. Suicide mission, mass effect two kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, th there was honestly, there was a lot about this that I find gameable. Um, you're overthrowing the tyrant, uh, bringing him to justice or at least ending his cruel reign of terror. That's, been done about 65,000 times. Not even um, the tyrant, though. The tyrant, the true tyrant, is the shogun. This is just some lackey, some yeah. friend of the tyrant. But he's a piece of shit. So, yeah. Yeah, overthrow him. Well, I mean, at that at that point in time, the emperor uh, was, was still there, but only being paid lip service to. Nobody um, actually cared about the emperor. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean... Yeah, the, the, the shaping of the battlefield was very important. Uh, just uh, how they came together as a party seemed seemed right for that. It was a very good party-building series of It was half the scenes. movie, yeah. Yeah, very quick scenes, yeah. I will agree. What do you think, Dusty? I, I, I think the, 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 that was the most gameable part of it probably would have been... I actually I I enjoyed the gaming part of the of the, the the actual fight itself. Now I know that would that would take a very long time. The way that was done in the movie would take a long time to play out. Depends on the gaming system, but, uh, but frequently, yes. yeah. That that was probably the the what I would I like a good session that is a battle session. I you like, like tactics? Yeah, I do, I do yeah. too. Yeah, I like a I you know I I, I like a, a character development. I like a story arc. I like a good build. I like the the exposition. I'm a writer. I I get all that. But when I'm I'm when I'm throwing dice, I want to fight. I want to play. Okay. Let's step back a little bit though. Mm -hmm. You specifically you did just say that you do like the story. You do like the character building. Mhm. Mm so let's take this movie. Now, one of your complaints about this movie was the story. Let's say right. that this were to be presented as a game mm -hmm. that you were to either, you were to in some way be involved with. Mm -hmm. What would make the story more interesting for you as a gamer? Like, how would you dive in more? Or what, what would you expand upon? What would be more interesting to you at the table for storytelling? I have an answer to that. Uh, for, I didn't. 
movie wise, I didn't like the I didn't like the hook. Do me a solid and go kill this guy. I well, it, it was it was there was a weak intro. I will like, correct you. It was not so much a do me a solid situation. It was more of a your situation sucks and I know that you want to die. So here's an opportunity to do it. Now, he could have had his reasons for doing that. You got to understand a little bit about the way Bushido works to know that it wasn't so much do me a favor as it was we need your help and you're the only one who can do this. Yeah, it's the help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. It I get was that. very much the Obi-Wan Kenobi. I, I, I get that, but as a writer and as someone who loves movies, it just it was a it was a weak grab. It was an extremely weak grab. Okay, I can I I follow you. Mm. But not as a writer and not as a movie. As a game. What would inspire you more from that? What would you want to see more of? Where would you want that to go? At what point would, I would you be like, I would want oh, the, give me more, I, I would, give me more. I would want the GM to, get, to give more of like a background. It's like, hey, this more of what's, what's going on from that character. Why is it so bad? Uh, you want to know more about like Shinzaman's past? Yes. Like, why is he being enticed? Yes. Okay. So if Shinzaman is your character, if you are playing that guy, you want more of a, got to give me more. Mm-hmm. I need a hook. Mm-hmm. Gotcha, Matthew. I would have liked, <clears throat> I would have liked uh, more of the political pressures that had brought this state to pass. Oh, that's good. Why is, why is the Shogun allowing a person like that even to be considered a seat on his council? That is I, a good you question. can't tell me that he doesn't know about his extracurricular activities because he just does them without a thought and without cleanup. You know, there's no crew silencing everybody. He just leaves the bodies. You know, that is a that is a good topic, especially from a gaming perspective. I've played in many games where the GM's like, Okay, there's this evil baron and you gotta go kill him. Okay, well why does this evil baron exist? Yeah, oh, he just does because he's rich. Yeah. But but do his superiors allow this? They just turn a boy and die. Why? Yeah. That was kind of this. Yeah. Okay, well do this. Yeah, but why? Like I think you can kind of relate it to, I guess, to any kind of European or medieval fantasy-based game where you have to go kill the Dark Lord or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> like, why does the Dark Lord exist? Because he does. Just go kill him. Well, I mean, yeah. Tolkien gives us a very good reason. Thousands and thousands of pages why the Dark Lord oh exists. Oh, my God. You know, I just oh, said yeah. that to needle him. That's okay. I know. I know you do. <laughs> and I thank you in one aspect because it's funny. And the other, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kick you in the junk. <laughs> I'm going to. Back you up here, Dusty. Mm-hmm. Tolkien's explanation for things are ham-fisted at times. Or, you know, if you play a and d game, okay, cool, we're going into this dungeon. Why does this dungeon exist? This dungeon makes no sense. Dwarves built it. Okay, why? how did the dwarves build Magical. He suddenly, you think, okay, Tolkien, fuck you. You know, give us a little bit more reason. I think that that's oversimplified. I mean, dwarves have an innate love of the underground. They're not fond of direct sunlight, and Mm -hmm. precious metals are not often found in stream beds. You gotta go really deep. So, okay, I can get that for mines. Mm -hmm. But, like, say, Moria? Okay, that's that's great. But most D&D games are going into these random ass dungeons, which make no sense. Oh, yeah. This was about token, not yeah. D&D. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> well, bastardized version. Sorry. I apologize. I was sort of making a, a few leaps of connection here. Being I D&D love inspired playing a token. dwarf. I, so I, do I. I see myself yeah, dwarfs as very much I play, oh, wait, wait. Are I, we all dwarf people? I always, oh, fuck, I yeah. always play a dwarven battle cleric. Dwarven. Yeah. F- but dwarven fucking clerics are yeah. the best. You, I've played <laughs> with you. You know what I play. Yes. Were you the cleric of dragon, right? Yes, my you made me game. pray to the dragons when I died. It was wonderful, wasn't it? It was the first <laughs> time I've ever had a GM actually make me pray <laughs> to my deity. When I run a game and somebody plays a cleric, they need to worship that god. Oh, yeah, not just I, I, and I pray for half an hour. That's usually how it's done. Yeah, I go in a corner and pray for a half hour. He was like, no, you need to get down on your fucking knees and you need to pray. <laughs> I did not make you yeah, get I on know, your knees. I know, but that's kind of what it was. How <laughs> many goats do you slaughter? <laughs> Well, no. Dragon Wright likes sacrifice. But anyway, and it was like, what do I, as, as a deity, he was like, okay, I'm going to bring you back to life. What the fuck do I get out of this? And I was like, oh, shit, I got to think on the fly here. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, if you think about it, a cleric, a cleric in a in a fantasy role-playing game, a cleric isn't just a wizard. Like, wizards learn ancient secrets from books and tomes, and they use science. 
A cleric, on the other hand, is somebody whose belief in a god is so intent that that god notices them. Notice mm-hmm. first notices them, two recognizes them, and then three deems them worthy to have a sliver of their attention and power. So at that point, you got to think that a cleric is somebody so ridiculously devout that you play a game, and if any if anything happens in that game that the party goes against that god's intentions or wishes, that god's going to have some words. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you start healing people that don't deserve to be healed, that god's going to have some words. So I take clerics very seriously. Paladins, too. Oh, I yeah. I fucking yeah. hate playing them. I love playing a paladin. I can't be that good. I love good. playing everything. I can't be that everything. good. I, I know I'm a good person in real life, more or less. I can't be that good. I think you might like 5th edition. It I've played 5th edition the a little bit. Paradigm. Okay. They're no longer lawful good all the time. Mm-hmm. Paladins are champions of a cause. Oh, okay. I could get behind that. They can be any alignment. You just pick a cause, and they fervently follow that cause. Oh, okay. They're pretty uh, cool. The cause of piracy. <laughs> <laughs> Robbing from the rich and to give to the brothel poor. <laughs> and brothels. <laughs> so um, I had a, a couple of options mm-hmm. um, okay. for a hook with this. And go I wasn't sure which way to go, how to bring this to the table. Because, A, there's only one left. And he was the student. And he's going to go to America and whore it up. Yeah, he was going to yeah. go be the best bandit ever. <laughs> yep. I considered going down that line, and you, as putting this on your gaming table, could as well. It's set during the time, if he does indeed go to America, of the um, Mexican-American Wars. So there's a background to it. Um, this is just before California? Well, the, the, or this the, the was movie, California. The, the movie is set 1844, so it's a little bit before uh, before that war. Yeah. So we'd have some time to go be the best bandit ever. Yeah. Is it going to say the Tokugawa shogunate ended in the 1860s? Yeah. And I think there was the text scrawl at the end of the movie that was like, the shogun ended like 20 years later. Yeah, so that would so have been you, 1864. You could yeah. literally take this guy and drop him into the Old West. So there's a movie based on that. Yeah. It's called The Way of the Warrior. Yeah. Have you seen it? Mm-hmm. It's awesome. It's schlocky. You know, it's that's, silly. That's why I but liked it. It yeah. is essentially what, yeah. 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 Um, so what you would do is gather a party around you uh, that he would probably pick up in Japan and go deal with these coarse, dishonorable American slobs. And that could be a lot of fun. You'd have to make your way across to the Old West. You'd have to learn about guns. There's all kinds of things you would have to do. And it would be fun because the world would be one you would understand if you were playing it correctly. I think he already knows a little bit about guns. They had guns. Oh, yeah. But just yeah. The, the system, this, this rigid system of honor that he had versus a system that's entirely based on pragmatic values would be a lot of fun to play around in because you don't fit it anywhere. Not well, he's not going to fit in anywhere in, in America at that point. Every, in time. every step would be interesting. Did he really say he was going to America? Yeah, yeah. he did. Every step would be oh, okay. incomprehensible. Oh, weird. He has no idea why the people around him do the things he do. They do, and his struggle to try and make his way in this completely alien environment would be just as hard as me trying to fit my head around this movie. <laughs> I think. The, I mean, the easiest progression from that for inspiration would be. The Sergio Leone westerns, like the oh, yeah. Fistful of Dollars yeah. and um, uh, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, the bad, the ugly yeah. which are basically samurai movies remade as American westerns. Yeah. Um, there's the more modern The Way of the Warrior. There's even a PlayStation 2 game called Samurai Western. Got Ooh. it. <laughs> it's not that good. It's just a stage after stage after stage of just beat em up, 3D beat em up kind mm. of stuff. But. Yeah, the there's a lot of socio stuff going on there too. Uh, the Chinese are imported to build the railroad. He's very easily mistaken for them by yeah. you know the Americans at the time. There would be a lot of fight, and there would be a lot of story in such a thing. That being said, the second option is a lot different. We are all enamored of the fight scene, right? Mm-hmm. Now that is a execute your plan and hold your ground, which is a lot of fun. To pull off. Has anyone ever done one of those in a game? Oh, yeah, many times. 
hold the pass, none shall pass kind of thing. Oh, yeah. It's, this is Sparta. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but without the 300 and painted <laughs> abs and dwarfs. Instead of 300, you only have 13. <laughs> um, and swords. What you do is you have an adventuring party, basically in any kind of campaign, though it would be easy enough to set it here in, uh, in feudal Japan. And this adventuring party comes across a town in dire straits. They could be ronin. They could be samurai. Um, the town hires them to defend them. Strong mountain pass. They're nestled in a vale high up it. A single road leads into it and leads out. There are mountains in Japan, just not very big ones. Um, <laughs> they're big enough. Yeah, Fuji's pretty big. I mean, um, <laughs> well, okay. A mountain is fucking big. Like, yeah. by, by nature of being a mountain, it's big. Yeah. And in this type of society with the type of technology it might as well be an impenetrable barrier well you are it is an impenetrable yeah. barrier because there is one small road in and one mm-hmm. small road out it's the only road in the neighborhood and an army is advancing along that road just before the town it narrows to the size of one wagon with a foot along every side you and your party have to defend that gap in the town it's a small village 200 people. Most of them are craftsmen of some kinds, hunter gatherers. Some grow small crops. There is a blacksmith, a carpenter, two men at arms. The men at arms are basically thief takers. They're, they're police. Mm-hmm. Uh, one to mind the tolls for the road. There are no trained soldiers in this town. There is just the party, but two men can block it effectively. How long can you hold out against this advancing army? Now that's as fun as the other one was. That's the game I want to play. Yeah, that would, that sounds great. Because I, that's you've picked your terrain. You may lay your traps. You can see the army coming at you. You have a certain amount of time to prep. What do you do? That sounds fun. It does sound pretty fun. Yeah, that reminds me of a whole lot of the Lone Wolf and Cup comics. Have you read those? No, I have all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and there's movies based on them too. Mm-hmm. And he, the guy who did the comics also did Shogun Assassin or uh, Shogun Samurai Executioner and some others. But that's the theme yeah. I think that should be played out from the movie, unless you are very hard up for samurai action, because that would be fun too. But this kind of concept, which I think was the real grab of the movie, of we're taking this place mm-hmm. and we're defending it and we're achieving our goal. Was was the yeah. real grab of the movie? It is the same story as Seven Samurai. Yeah, it is the we have a small force, they have a large force. We have a place. We're going to bring them to this place, and we're going to build a murder hole. Yeah, and I, I honestly, you, it'll work in any system. It'll yeah. work in any concept. It'll work in any party. You can take the same thing with dwarves and elves and orcs, mm-hmm. or you can do the same thing with pure vanilla humans. A- anyway, this will be an epic game you will remember for all your life. So fight it, because it's going to be good. No, I, I agree. I agree. I like what he had to say. For me to run a samurai game, big fight or none, one of the things that has to be innate to the setting, uh, to the characters, again, harking back to how I hope this segment opened up, is the theme of death. Constantly spoken throughout this movie by the characters is how they wish to die, or how they pledge their lives how they themselves give their entire existence to this cause to and that cause simply being you're my boss it's so asinine to me but yeah <laughs> it, no it, it is you're yeah. my boss i will die for you i wish vince why aren't you dying for me <laughs> <laughs> so the cause of the vassal mm-hmm. the, the vassal and the master the, well the, the honorable vassal it's another really good movie We'll probably never get to it, so I'm going to talk about it real quick. It's that movie, Ghost Dog, Way of the Samurai. That's a great movie. Ghost Dog the mo- is this modern assassin who is obsessed with Bushido, specifically because of a book that I quoted opening this section, The Hagakure, by Yamamoto Sunitomo, written in the late 1800s by this aging samurai who was just writing his memoirs of his notes of what it means to be a true samurai and all of it is essentially in order to be a samurai you got to die for somebody that's about it die for somebody kill for somebody put yourself in life to the true samurai acts as if his life is already gone thus he has nothing to forfeit when he dies like 
that concept of just death, 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 death. And that's tough for a role-playing game because if you're going to play for more than one session, you kind of, you're going to buy in as a player. Yeah. You want a character, mm -hmm. you want some assurance that your character is going to stick around. So the concept of being willing to die is something that I've thought about a lot in game design. And I thought about it a lot when looking at other samurai games, how they make it so easy to not die. Legend of the Five Rings, it's so easy to not die. Every samurai game I've ever played, it's like they fall back on role-playing game stereotypes or role-playing game expectations of, well, I want to keep playing, so I don't want my character to die. Yeah. But that defeats the point of being a samurai. So it's tough to have a game where you're willing to die. Unless. Because then you don't get to play anymore. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's a tough design decision if you're going to make a samurai game. If you're going to run a samurai game and you really want to stick to that theme, then you got to probably house rule some shit. I've always found that the concept of final strike serves that admirably. Do you mean like the, the dying action kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, to, to sell your life for a good cause makes it, um, makes it much more palatable to lose what you've invested so much time in. So, like, uh, he's he's killed by his enemy at the very end of this movie, yeah. right? But the DM allows him no rolls. He's right there. You have a spare sword that is not engaged. Final strike. And he takes his opponent with him I in like a glorious that. death. I do like yeah, that. That, that is a mechanic that I've used as a DM many times. And it makes a death... Because it's... Despite your, your back and forth of heroes... The, we assume the PCs are vaguely heroic. It makes a hero's death from just a, a, a numerical exercise into something epic. And I think that's very important to a game, especially if you want a player to think of it fondly for a yeah, long time. You want a player to appreciate death yeah. and to seek it out and to not be afraid of it. Yeah. And the problem with that is the time that it takes to make a character. So let's say we're, hey, Guys, we're going to get out. I'm going to run this game, and I want you guys to play in it. We're going to play for 12 sessions. And mm -hmm. you got to be ready for your character to die at any time, but you can keep coming back. Okay, cool. Everybody's on board. All right, cool. Let's make characters. 12 hours <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah. So this Palladium character is dusty. Mm. What if, <laughs> I just killed, just what if that character just died in the first session? Would you have felt a, a loss of investment? <laughs> Like fucking hated you. Why didn't you? <laughs> you just made a character generator. Why didn't you do Palladium? Oh dear God! I'm gonna. I'm you gonna. Should. It's on the list. All right. Uh, it's on the list. Down the line. Right now, I'm sticking with the basics. Okay. Cool. Th that's a conundrum. Like you, you want to play the game, and oh yeah, death. I'm all about death. But character creation took me four days. Like I had to think about that, and you killed me in the first session. And the GM's like, "Yeah, dude, make it to the character." You're like, well, fuck you, man. <laughs> what? What? Do you, are you my friend? <laughs> like, why would you do this to me? I don't really care about the investment. You just wasted my time. Yeah. And it's a tough balance. And that that's going to be hard to talk about games because very few games. There's a handful that do. And I'm not even going to talk about those games because they don't even fit this theme. But there's a handful of games that really do take into the account of the fact that your character's going to die. But here, I just have a new one in two minutes later. I can't think of any samurai games that do that. So we got to go the Chanbar route and lean on the fact of either your character's only going to die in an appropriate way, or at least when you die, you're going to fuck someone up when you do. Yeah. So taking that into account, I have some ideas for games. So I do want to read a thing to both of you. Okay. This is a question. So people think of some answers. While on his way to the sutra readings in Hosa Kanoji, the samurai Tojin and his younger pages had to cross the fabled Ku River via ferry boat. During the crossing, one of the pages got drunk and took it upon himself to pester one of the fairies' sailors. By the time they reached the other side, the page had drawn his sword as an idle drunken threat. But before he could use it, the sailor struck the page on the head with his fairy pole, knocking him down. Upon seeing this happen, what should the samurai Tojin do? 
talk amongst yourselves. So this this is a samurai situation. My pupil has just brought dishonor. Right? Is is that a correct you're, reading? You were on a boat mm-hmm. crossing a river. Your pupil drew got drunk, drew his sword, and threatened one of the sailors. They shouldn't have the even sailor, gotten that far. The sailor used his pole and struck your pupil. I don't know enough about the society, yeah. so any answer I make is going to be wrong. That's fine. But here's what That's I would do. That's the best do. part of this question. In that, I would take his sword hand. Cut his hand off. That's the first time I've heard that one. <laughs> he has brought dishonor. I will not make him commit ritual suicide, but he has definitely brought dishonor upon my house and my name and me and my teachings, most importantly, and he is obviously unfit to bear that sword. I like that. What do you think, Dusty? I don't know, actually. I'd throw him in the river. Throw him in the river? Yeah. And just let him swim to shore. Yeah. And then sleep in wet clothing and <laughs> not near a fire. Well, should Tojin be a true samurai, there is only one truly acceptable course of action. He must approach the sailor and the page, apologize, and then cut them both down where they stand. Because this is a game about death. The true samurai lives his life and performs his tasks as if he is already dead and thus has nothing to fear from the spilling of his life's blood. The mechanics of this game allow seven possible ways to die, each of which you can easily prevent, but none of which you should actively avoid. But remember, not every death is one of the blood. Wait a second. Why, why would the samurai attack the ferryman? Because fuck them. That's why. So samurai are essentially psychopaths? Samurai? Yeah, yeah that's what I'm getting more, they're more. Going. You attack a, You insult a samurai, you're dead. You insult somebody who belongs to the samurai, you're dead. The samurai can do whatever he wants. Ultimately, the samurai is the source of the Lord's law. And if you insult the samurai or you insult someone with the samurai, you are insulting the Lord. And by insulting the Lord, you your death. life is forfeit. Okay. Well, I didn't know that complicated situation what i have just read is something i want another question now i can answer like a samurai what i, I have just them all. read is part of the introduction <laughs> to my own game moto bushido which actually i wrote as an homage to 13 samurai plus sons of anarchy don't don't ask it's a fun game motorcycles and samurai it's great i bring this game up first because it's not the game that i'm pitching mm-hmm. but it is a game that i want to heavily talk about because I don't really talk about my stuff that much, but I feel that this one is spot on. This is a game about fucking killing each other. This is a game about dying and achieving the good death. However, for your scenario of a big old battle, Moto Bushido might not be the best one. This is a game for one-on-one duels. Chanbara style, face-to-face. I'm going to go at each other, and then one of us is going to survive kind right. of thing. I want to talk about Moto Bushido later, but it is a game about motorcycle samurai. It has some amazing art. Uh, if you, I don't know if any of you have seen this book. No, I've seen it. Yep. Yeah. I, it. I bring it up because I feel that people who know me are going to expect me to talk about it, so I've got it out of the way. <laughs> I want to talk about Sengoku. Sengoku is a game of Chanbar role-playing in feudal Japan. So this is the first edition, which I found used copy at a bookstore by accident. Mm -hmm. And this is probably the most narratively in-depth role-playing game I have ever read. 90% of this book is historical text. Nice. I wish that I had known that this game existed when I was writing Muda Bushido because there's so much detail about travel about the world about the politics about religion about life about structure about money about occupations about everything that you can think of this might as well be an academic textbook Mm -hmm. with game mechanics sort of tacked in like all right here's the monetary system here's how to roll for money right it just mixes everything in in a way that i wish that i could find more historical texts that would do that closest thing i found are the osprey books and even them they don't really incorporate mechanics but i hate this game system (laughs) oh really (laughs) this if you take a look at that it uses an old system called fusion which in my opinion is complicated as fuck wasn't that the one that tried to like uh 
bring in D and D and GURPS and maybe yeah uh yeah it it was like a hodgepodge of things i i'm really not the best uh person to talk about fusion i couldn't even tell you how it works i've played it a few times i i found it cumbersome but the book i love the cover it's one of my favorite game book covers ever i find it evocative it has this collage of interests it shows different aspects of the world caveat Sengoku is set in a period of time before the Tokugawa yeah. Shogunate. Mm-hmm. That period of time specifically that uh, the villain in this movie wanted to return to. Yeah, because he talked about the age of war. So The Sengoku period is essentially the age of war. It's all of the various clans essentially trying to exterminate each other mm-hmm. and become the ruling family achieve the shogunate position or appease whoever was probably going to become the shogunate this is, this is full of info <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i mean there's there's a lot happening here oh there's demon stuff too interesting i like the crab bull he makes me happy and, and he if, looks delicious and of course i would do a disservice if i didn't mention legend of the five rings which for many people is you know the Asian-esque role-playing game of samurai. It's in a fictional setting. Very heavy demonic and magical themes in it. I don't necessarily think it fits and I don't think its mechanics are suitable to the concept of the grand battle. Dear God. (laughs) Sengoku is thick. (laughs) Yeah, conversion notes for advanced Dungeons and Dragons and Oriental Adventures. Conversion notes for chivalry and sorcery. Somebody took their time. Conversion notes... For GURPS, Hero System, Legend of the Five Rings, yep. <laughs> conversion notes for the Usagi Yojimbo role-playing game. <laughs> Which was Somebody the next game time. I was going to mention. We yeah. talked about Myriad Song on mm-hmm. the uh, Valerian episode. That same company made the Usagi Yojimbo role-playing game. Now, Usagi Yojimbo is one of my favorite series of comics that is kind of like an anthropomorphic version of this like you read the comics and it's brutal. It is crazy brutal. Yeah. It, they 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 mask it with some kind of comic style. Oh, some skulls floating over people's heads, representing that they're dead. But he kills a lot of fucking people. There's a lot of death in those comics. A lot of violence. And among the people that he encounters, there's a lot of depression. There's a lot of sad stories that he can't solve. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a good example of this kind of thing in action. I would say Yusaki Yojimbo. Eh, this wasn't really an anthropomorphic movie, so I don't want to lean heavily on that. Another game I want to talk about is a game called Burning Wheel. Okay. Neither of you have played that, have you? Nope. Mm -hmm. Never even heard of it. Burning Wheel is this strange hybrid of story game and crazy, crunchy combat mechanic. So, Burning Wheel... Uh, you build a character with a life path system. Like, oh, what were you at this point in your life? And then what did you become? And then where did you go from there? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was an urchin. And then I was a coin clipper. And then I was a fence. And then I was a crime lord. All right, right cool. And I have these skills because of it. Well, Burning Wheel has a setting book, which is out of print, unfortunately, called The Blossoms Are Falling. So the blossoms are falling are set in the Heian era of Japan, which is significantly further in the past, but it's so easily adapt because, again, Japan is kind of locked in this stagnation, this cultural and technological stagnation that everything that applies in the burning wheel or in blossoms in the Heian era. Mm-hmm. If you're going to make a role playing game about Heian era, it can apply to Sengoku or Tokugawa era Japan. The, the blossoms are falling. You could take things a step further if you really wanted to dive into the society. Mm -hmm. It has a mechanic for haiku battles. Yeah. All right. Do you do do this at the table? Yeah. (laughs) It has a mechanic for honor and face and shame. Like samurai, people of station, have both honor and shame. Because the more honor you gain, you've done some shameful things to get there. And eventually, if your shame surpasses your honor to a point, you got to kill yourself. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard for me because there's such a disconnect between Matthew's world and this world. This world. Yeah. yeah. Same, it, same with me. Yeah. Completely. 
But I do think that you, Matthew, specifically would like Burning Wheel's optional in-depth combat system called Fight! Exclamation point. So there's the standard combat, which is I roll, you roll, whoever mm-hmm. wins applies their thing. Fight is a three stanza, beat by beat, scripting of action. So what you do, hear this out. All right. So you script three stanzas of action. On the first stanza, I'm going to lunge. On the next stanza, I'm going to dodge. And on the third stanza, I'm going to lunge again. But then they script on the first stanza, I'm going to block. On the second stanza, I'm going to lunge. And on the third stanza, I'm going to faint. You script three, they script three, and then you lay them out. And then you compare what matches up. Well, I lunged, but they fainted, so this happens. Or... I dodged, but they lunged, so this happens right. kind of thing. I like it. It's really only good for, like, one-on-one I'm like boss fight kind yeah. of thing. Like, this is you versus me, the Highlander versus the Kurgan kind of final encounter nice. things. Dibs on Kurgan. But it's really cool. Once you get the hang of it, you just, like, oh, no, beep, 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 and they go beep, beep, beep. You flip reveal, and it becomes this game of both RPG and kind of reading second guessing yeah it's poker second guess it. yeah like is the you gotta in order to do it right of course the gm has to commit to playing the character okay and not just trying to beat the player and the player has to be like i think the kurgan is going to act in this way this way and this way so i'm going to act in this way so yeah. again it's a matter of like reading each other in burning wheel blossoms are falling it creates some amazing samurai duels hmm yeah, that sounds like an interesting mechanic. I'd, I'd be down for that. I can second guess people pretty well. <laughs> Just the game that I, I want to pitch, it's called Kaigaku. Kaigaku is what is, oh, I've mentioned this before, called an OSR, old school renaissance kind of game. It is a game basically based on D&D rules. Remember how we talked about the uh, the game in... What was that? The, the closest thing I can relate it to is the game for the Three Musketeers. Flashing mm-hmm. Blades. Yeah. Super simple. This is basically like that. Okay. Oh, wow. That and, is a small character sheet, though. Yeah. Crazy small. Because you're going to die. <laughs> what do you Holy need? Holy shit. Yeah, that is. It does have the traditional D&D stats. Yeah. It has a dueling system. There's There are actually a couple of expansions for it as well. And this game is written by one of my online sort of contacts, a fellow named Jacob Ross. I backed this for a Kickstarter, and when I got it, I was immediately impressed. It does what I wanted Oriental Adventures to do. Is this a D20 variant? D20, absolutely. I love me some D20. It is based on a version of D20 called the Black Hack. Uh Uh-huh. The Black Hack is somebody took the concept of the old school D20 game and made a super fast, simplified, streamlined version of it. Uh Like your inventory system consists of, I have eight slots of items. Where do I put them? Or, uh, you know, you don't really roll against your opponent. You roll against yourself. Like, am I good at fighting? Well, I'm going to roll against my fighting ability and then factor in some things. It's super fast. The reason I'm pitching it is I think it could pull that off and still have that feeling of deadliness. I want, I really want I'm impressed. I this is want... the first time you've brought anything D20 related to the table. Yeah. Yeah, I was kind of thinking the same thing. Yeah. I want to say Savage Worlds. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> and Savage Worlds could do the murdering of hundreds of mooks, but this can too, in a more familiar six stat roll a D20 kind of way. Yeah. Interesting. I'm digging it. Kaigaku. It is a fictional setting. By Jacob D.C. Ross. Yep. It, is, it is a fictional, Japanesque kind of setting. Jacob lives just across the river, up in Washington, really close by. I don't remember where. It's not Vancouver, but it's close. He's very active online and has a number of things. He even has a, a samurai dice game that's pretty cool and a card game. This is what I think would work best for us to do. I'm down. It looks fun, and I'm already familiar with D20 rules. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the best part is the familiarity. It, it, 
it's got the six stats, you know. I gotta tell you, I I know you like a lot of uh a lot of different kind of styles, but I'm I'm a proponent of D twenty because I feel that it is a great leveler mm-hmm. I agree. that allows Absolutely. you to I, I granted the combat, woof. It, it can take some time. But it doesn't have to. Like it really doesn't. It can. It if you're getting does. creative, it does. I think that there are ways to avoid that. And there are some simple tricks, such as whenever you roll to attack, roll your damage die at the same time. Yeah. Like just get all your dice and yeah. roll them at the same time. Yeah. You don't, yeah. don't roll it and then see if you hit and then roll your damage and do it. Roll it all at once. Save some time. Or pay attention. Mm-hmm. GMs, Matthew, you're up. Dusty, you're on deck. So yeah. prepare your action. Matthew, what do you do? And you've already prepared your action because last time I said that Dusty was up, you were preparing your action. Uh, there's many ways to speed it up. And essentially, it's a kind of, okay, it's your turn. What do you do kind of game that doesn't have to take so long. But it always does. <laughs> I think especially, sorry, Jerome, fourth ed. Uh, Don't apologize God. for fourth ed. I got to I got it. Okay, I'm going to do this, and it's going to move your minis in that way, but it's going to set off this chain reaction that moves those minis in this way. Any mini in a five-foot radius is going to have this effect. Okay, I need every single one of you to make a saving throw. Now, if you don't make the saving throw, this thing happens. But if you do, this other, you still take half damage. Now, i got to roll this damage. I'm going to do this. I mean, come on. Yeah. I, that was an abortion. I feel the same about third. It was awful. Yeah, it was set up to be an MMO. That's what they, yeah. were, that's what they were trying to do. And you were talking about, like, I, I called, I'm sorry, I called you out on the whole thing earlier. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, this whole thing would take, like, 15 minutes of game time. I can't think of any game system I've ever played where that entire encounter would take 15 minutes of game no, time. I was exaggerating. Yeah. So Savage Worlds, maybe a session, because it deals with mooks very well. The entire, no. <laughs> but you can turn that into a damage roll. So here's some advice. Start over. If you want a game that deals with that kind of just murderification of unnamed characters, you don't need a game system that already takes that into account. You can take whatever your favorite game is. You can take White Wolf. You can take Palladium. You can take D&D. You can take whatever. And you can just have 5,000 kobolds. 5,000 kobolds are coming upon my hero. All right. Cool. I'm going to roll to attack. I hit. I roll 18 points of damage with my sword. How about just that kills 18 kobolds? I always turn it into uh, an exchange. You know, those big things of D sixes, the tiny D Mm sixes that they sell for those massive damage, the brick. Yeah. The brick. I flip them to six. Um, and then I spread them all out all over the map and that's the enemy. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll just fudge it. If it's a fireball, they're gone. If it's an arrow storm, I'll flick some of them to three for for various wounds and take a couple off. If, you know, area of effect, I mean, it's just, it's a good place to, to house rule, that kind of thing. I mean, a good mook shouldn't have more than six hit points yeah. either. So, yeah, you just fucking flip it, roll it, spread yep. it. All right, each one of those, that's how many hit points they have. Yeah. All right, so you've just rolled And there's 18. like 50 of them, so you have three bricks. <laughs> yeah. you, you effectively have a small yeah. army. Yeah. <laughs> I think the, tip, the trick to that is to allow one damage roll to affect multiple enemies. Oh, yeah. So I swing my sword, I do 18 points of damage. All right, I take the four, the six, the four, and the four. All right, I took mm-hmm. out four of them, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, when dealing with smaller foes, uh, you can use this in army tactics, too, where it's opposing armies. You just have different colors of dice. We used to play this game we called Monkey Knife Fight. Go on. I'm listening. <laughs> Monkey Knife Fight is you get a handful of D6s, mm-hmm. you get a handful of D6s, and you roll those D6s. <laughs> okay. If you only see what Matthew is doing. <laughs> He's fondling his imaginary D6s. Dice. You get D6s. Hand- right. D6s. So D6s. you roll them. For every Whoa. six that you roll, your opponent removes one die from their pool. Mm-hmm. For every one that you roll, you take out that die from your own pool. Ah. And whoever because the monkeys has the last frequently die? stab themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I like Monkey it. Fight. Whenever I play Savage Worlds or run Savage Worlds games where I'm running a group and they're like, okay, we're up against 400 people. I'm just like, Okay, but we got 200 people with us. Fuck. (laughs) 
okay, I'm just rolling some monkey knife fight here. Yeah. Take it off, things. <laughs> and that, that, cause you I've, know, I've yet to see something for large scale actions that I find usable. So I just, I tend to house rule that shit. Mm. House and, rules are good. I, yeah. I'm a big fan of house ruling. And just the thing to remember when doing that is to always, always spend time on your descriptions, make it epic. Because your characters, your, your players, not your characters, have spent a long time building up to a point where they can have an epic battle. And they've earned it. Mm-hmm. They want it. Yeah. yeah. And at the end of the day, your job as a, as a GM, DM, game master, storyteller, whatever, is to deliver an escapist adventure that they love and that they will remember fondly for, for quite some time. At least that's the way I've always seen it. I have to completely agree with also you. Also being said, yeah. sometimes you just got to kill them all. And that's why they sell the total party kill stickers for your GM screen. Yes. TPKs I don't use are great. I roll everything out in the open. I know. You're, yeah, but you're some sort of strange No, creature. I <laughs> firmly believe in the dice lay where they fall. I lie. Yeah, I, I lie, lie for the story all the time. I want my players to see that the world is fair. That I am using the same mechanics that they are beholding to. I want them to see my critical hits because I want them to know. Well, that I, am I, not I can being too, but I can always just like pull up the like. Okay, so yeah, you're seeing it. I can just pull up the screen, but th- then the screen goes back down. I, can't I don't also. I, I get up and walk around having a. Screen I know. I've I've like, I've yeah. gamed with you. I know. I mean, having I've had a big baddie that could do a lot of fucking damage and I don't want someone to see how many dice I want the sound to reach yeah. them. First. Well, here's, exactly. <laughs> that's here, it. Here, here's that's the more intimidating. The and, sound and is more intimidating. Like All right. And then you. I'm going to let you guys in on a secret. Mm-hmm. I never give my, any of my enemies stats. They roll exactly how many dice I want them to roll at any one time and they roll exactly with the modifiers that I want them to roll at any one time. I know that I hate that in a movie. However, running a game, I know what players want. What players want is a satisfying combat. And if I give my enemy hit points, fuck, whatever. They're just going to chew through it, and then it's not going to be as rewarding of a fight. So I draw it out. Mm -hmm. Like you got to feel the beat of the moment. Like if if they're fighting a thing and that thing's like, and they're just hitting it really hard, really hard. Well, if this is supposed to be the boss, I'm sorry. I've been a player in a group that just one shot at a boss. And it sounds cool, but when it happens, you're just, all right. See y'all next week. That was, (laughs) that was, that was kind of anticlimactic. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like the first borderlands. Yeah. <laughs> I got so bored with that game. Yeah, I love that game. No, I, just... I, like the, I like the first one. I love oh. the second one. Well, okay. Anyway, but the whole... I want every encounter to be fulfilling in a way. Mm-hmm. So with Savage Worlds, Savage Worlds especially, enemies have exactly what you want them to have. It's, it's a game designed to be run on the fly. So uh, whereas with D&D, it's like a resource management. So especially with Third Ed and later... You want to design encounters so that the heroes have used X number of resources per day at this particular time. Me, I'm just more like, I just want to pull this encounter out of my butt. So this enemy has X minus five hit points. X being the number of attacks I feel that until you are satisfied with the combat. (laughs) I, um, I, I reward stupidity or inattention. Very harshly in my games, I I I will I will murder a PC. I will straight up murder them if if they give me an opening, and by doing something stupid or something disruptive. Oh, that should always be on the table. Oh yeah, hmm? I think if you are playing a game, if you are a player in a game with hit points, you are playing in a game with a death mechanic. Yeah, you are playing in a game where your character can die. You should be ready for your character to die. That should just be it. Like, and a DM shouldn't be afraid to do that. No, either. no, I agree. I know you're sitting down with your friends, but you can kill your friends. Oh, yeah. Controversial opinion. Wizards have a spell book. DMs, take it away from them. That's what it's oh, there yeah. for. Yeah. Like, otherwise, why is it there? Mm-hmm. Like, 
people are like, oh, wizards are too powerful. Blah, blah, blah. How do I balance them? You take away their fucking spell book. Mm-hmm. Or, you, or you threaten it. You don't take it away, but you threaten to take it away. You constantly set occasions. Because wizards have entire spells in their spell list. Oh, that's a big glowing Achilles. To protect yeah. their spell book. But do they it, ever take it? GMs are like, oh, no, no, no. Do they ever take that spell? Oh, typically, very no. rarely. Typically, no. <laughs> in my games, they do. <laughs> because I recognize the reason the spell book is there mechanically in the first place, which is to be threatened. Mm-hmm. Whereas other GMs are like, I would never threaten to take away a player's <laughs> ability to be of agency. Fuck you. That's why it's there. Yeah. And if you think that taking away a wizard's spell makes that character ineffectual, well, what are all those other numbers on the character you, sheet? You want your players yeah. hanging on your every word. That's why you're a DM, yeah. mm-hmm. because you you're enjoy telling, a, good telling story. a story. Yeah. And here's a dirty little secret. If they're scared because of a couple object examples, they'll listen. Mm-hmm. Fucking Dusty was in a game that I ran a Palladium game where I had a character. Chris. Chris played a, a warlock. And, well, I'm sorry, Elemental Wizards in Palladium. Chris played a warlock who pissed off his patron and lost all his magic. And he fucking ran with it. Mm-hmm. He was like, you know what? I have hundreds of other numbers on my character sheet. <laughs> Literally, it is plenty of. <laughs> I have words and numbers on my character sheet that are not spells and the level of spells that I can use to play this game. So GMs, if you think you're taking away a player's agency by taking away the one thing that their character is good at, guess what? There's more of a game than that. If you take away the fighter's sword, have them get another sword or have them mm-hmm. try something else. Maybe yeah. that fighter should have a diplomacy skill. Or maybe they have underwater basket weaving and that's going to save the day. <laughs> if that wizard probably has other stats. And if they use charisma as a dump stat, then fuck them. Yeah. Fuck that's em. a good way to get rid of min-maxing. Mm-hmm. Also, whenever I play a wizard, I have two <laughs> spell books. And let me tell you, that gets expensive. Two spell... They... You're like me. I know, except eviler. <laughs> but I feel that you probably grew up playing the same games probably. where that was the thing that you did. You oh, didn't yeah. have one spell book. You no. had a traveling spell book. Yeah. You had a spell book and a safe deposit box at the bank. If you can afford three. <laughs> if. Then you had a phantom spell book. And yeah. That spell book was the most ostentatious looking one. It had the most runes carved on one it. One of my characters it has spells skinned in it. himself to yeah. get the spells off his back. Which he had tattooed there. I like that. That's beautiful. That is that is yeah. kind of nice. I had myself skinned <laughs> because one and two failed, but three was still there. <laughs> I really want to play some Palladium right now. <laughs> and on that note, so <laughs> we are just sort of devolving in this. this ah, screw it. D and D nostalgia. Here. So what we have here is uh, is thirteen assassins and Kaigaku. Kaigaku by Jacob D.C. Ross. It is an old school Renaissance OSR game based on a Japanese kind of setting. I'm really happy we got a D20 in there. Yeah, yeah. it's it. I was surprised it. It's yeah. it is yeah. a D20 game. I actually yep. thought it'd be like episode 50 when we finally got to a D20. <laughs> I kind of did too. No, it's, or, it's good. Or, it has a dueling system. It's got, you know, the standard what you would expect for hit dice. It's got character classes. It's got random encounter tables. This is, this is a fucking D&D game. Just yeah. set in the right setting. Set, um, yeah. Dusty, do we want to talk about next week? Yes, we can talk about next week. Next week we are doing, uh, this is my choice, and we are going to be bringing in, going into John Wick. Yeah. Yes. I know, I said that actually. I have a feeling this is going to be a movie we all agree on. Yeah, there's not going to be any bickering on this. I don't think (laughs) so, yeah. And then he did this. It was so cool. (laughs) Yeah, that's pretty much kind of the the form that, like, before, like, initially when when I was going to be doing the podcast uh, completely alone, I think John Wick is going to be the one where that's going to basically be what I had envisioned to begin with. It's right. just where I was going to be like, like you just said, and then, and then, and then, oh my God, and then, and then, and then. <laughs> and, that uh, and yeah, I, I really enjoy John Wick, the, the John Wick movie for multiple reasons. And uh, I think it's definitely one that, that highlights uh, a good revenge set. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. So that's what we're doing and, next week. And to me, next time, it's the best revenge, the simplest revenge. 
you killed my dog. Oh, yeah. <laughs> fuck you. And fuck you yeah. and everyone around you. Yeah. Your whole entire, literally your whole entire family. So he's kind of samurai in that way. Fuck you and everyone around you. Essentially. Did yeah. you see it? You're yeah. dead. We got to do Ghost Dog someday. There's a Ghost Dog role playing game. Oh, License <laughs> and everything. And it's good. All right. So, yes, next uh, next uh, next episode, John Wick, and uh, that'll be fun. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next thanks, week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of our show. We're a new name in the enormous sea of podcasts and appreciate any feedback that you can send our way. If you like what you've heard, or even if you didn't, please leave us a review and let us know. Got a movie or a game that you want to hear us talk about? Drop us a comment on our website at havemovieswillgame.com or hit us up on any of the usual social networks. We'd love to hear from you. The opening theme music is Rock and Gravel by Sid Valentine's Patent Leather Kids, part of the public domain and found on publicdomain4u.com. Opening narration is provided by Isaac Scher. Have Movies Will Game is distributed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you again next week.